Episode 31, Bakir Special Law, 4. The story of the life-turning story of the girl who earned 10 billion won by moving sticks quickly spread throughout Underdog City, and indeed throughout the Baskerville's estate. Rumor has it that Underdog City even provided a separate bodyguard to protect the girl's prize money. This is what the law is. It must be observed. The short speech of the newly appointed young vice consul was being talked about in the mouths of countless people every day. Naturally, the law created by Vakir, the so called Vakir Special Law, became more famous than the Baskerville's Autonomy Act. The magnates were talking like this. They say the new deputy consul is different no matter what. Consul Vakir says he keeps his word no matter what happens. Since that day, the crime rate in Underdog City has dropped by half. The saying that the law is far and the fist is close is an old saying. Now the law that is close will make the fist far. If you break the law, you are punished, and if you follow the law, you are rewarded. This simple principle once again moved citizens. A society where principles stand firm. Since that day, much of the distrust of laws that have not been followed has been washed away. It could be seen that from the day after the Bakir special law was promulgated, illegal activities noticeably disappeared and the crime rate was cut in half. Half of the darkness that had been deeply rooted in underdog poetry was resolved with this one performance. Underdog City Hall The Chihuahua Baskerville office manager was smiling and writing words on a plaque. Imokjasin This is a sign that will be hung in the consul's office starting today. Bakir was staring at it next to the Chihuahua and then said something. The Chihuahua manager writes really well. No problem. Since I was born, I have never seen anyone better at writing than me. Since the consuls always asked me to sign for them, I even got into imitating other people's handwriting. The Chihuahua couldn't finish his sentence. This is because Bakir blurted out something unexpected. Can't I learn too? The Chihuahua's eyes widened after hearing Bakir's words. It was the first time that a proud member of the Baskerville family from the main family made a request rather than an order to a mere servant. Moreover, even though he eats cutlery, he is also interested in brushes. No problem. Of course I can teach you. It is an honor. Thank you. Then, whenever you have time, please ask for it. A Chihuahua hums and plays with a brush after being praised. Vikir looked at him blankly. Chihuahua Baskerville. He was a commoner who came from outside the country, and after working as a contract worker for the Baskerville family for three years, he was officially incorporated into the family, taking on the last name of Baskerville. Unlike swordsmen who become guardian knights and are given Baskerville-style swordsmanship, administrators receive little compensation and are not given anything special. Just by learning the Baskerville style of swordsmanship, the level of swordsmanship goes up several levels, so swordsmen have the motivation to become a member of the Baskervilles, but it is true that for administrators like Chihuahua, there is no merit that is particularly attractive other than honor. As I know this person probably came to the Baskervilles with the intention of serving his hometown. Vikir had seen the Chihuahua a few times before returning. Despite his treacherous appearance, he was a man who regularly spoke directly to the consuls and vice-consuls with his courageous nature. And because of that, he was a talented administrator who was relegated to a remote area and did not see the light of day until he died of old age. When Vikir was thinking about Chihuahuas. By the way, you are amazing, assistant consul. After finishing the chant, the Chihuahua looked at Vikir and said. Who would have known that you would present such an unconventional performance? I truly admire this Chihuahua. Even though I have worked here as an office manager for 20 years, this is the first time I have felt this kind of emotion. My heart is still shaking. Vikir nodded slightly. The Baskerville's laws are actually quite well made. But just presenting the law to the world is not the answer. Isn't it important that the people of the territory believe in it and follow it? You're right. This is a very wise statement. However, the vice consuls before that did not think like that. You shouldn't just be angry that the people of the territory distrust or look down on the law. So, after thinking about how I could attract the attention of the people of the territory and leave a strong impression, I did just that. In fact, this is a performance performed by Camus of the Rue Morgue quite a bit later. Morgue Camus, who would later be called Empress Dowager, 
became a powerful figure as soon as she ascended to the position of head of the family, turning her territory into a region governed by strong law. The residents of that land did not pick up money that fell on the ground, and there were no fights between them, so the crime rate was almost zero. However, because of the reign of terror, it was not well liked by the people of the territory. However, as the war against the demon world was taking place, Camus' iron-fisted rule was able to dramatically increase the survival rate of humans, and in fact, even after the generation of destruction, the number of survivors remaining in Morgue's domain was the largest. Well, this wasn't something I was thinking about right now. Now the problem is the future. Vikir said, looking down at the map of Underdog City. Since 10 billion won was given out as prize money, we need to find a hole to fill, right? Soon, Bakir picked up a pen and started drawing X's in red all over the map. Bakir puts an X in every corner of the alley as if he knows exactly where and what is. XXXXXXX. The number of X shapes drawn in this way quickly exceeds a hundred. It is a place where illegal organizations are hiding or will be hiding in the future. We will crack down on these places one by one and return the black money to the national treasury. Ha, huh, how did you know? Are there places where criminals work? It stinks. Vikir presses his nose and grins. The Baskerville's hounds have a keen sense of smell. Vikir, leaving the blank-faced Chihuahua behind, continued to recite his future plans. In the law of war, the best way to procure military supplies is to procure them from the enemy's camp. If we clear out everything here, tax revenue will increase significantly. With that, we can strengthen the welfare system for the poor. Oh you have a clear eye. By the way, there are still a lot of ex-characters. I guess there were that many hidden organizations, right? Okay. This is even though the crime rate has been cut in half. Because of the performance, the number of overt crimes has decreased, but those that remain have become more secretive and sophisticated. But it doesn't matter. Vikir knew the location of these illegal organizations as well as the locations of the major organizations that were at their core. It's an area that was patrolled and cracked down tirelessly before returning. I still have vivid memories of becoming a hunting dog during the war on crime and frantically biting and killing rats in the back alleys. Also, among my close colleagues, there were some who had accepted bribes, so I knew all about their methods. There is nothing we don't know about how criminals think and act, where they hide, what methods they use, and how active they are. He also knew all the distribution channels through which underground funds would flow for at least the next 25 years. Buzz buzz buzz. Beelzebub, lurking in the arteries of the wrists, begins to tremble slightly as if he senses the deadly force. It means that you are hungry for blood. Right then. Vice Consul. The door opens and an employee comes in with an embarrassed expression. I received a request for a meeting. At those words, both Vikir and the Chihuahua turned their heads. The Chihuahua asked first. Who asked for a meeting during official hours? To someone who has been in office for less than two days. Well, that. The Youth Autonomy Committee of Haiyangcheng would like to welcome the vice governor at least once. Then the Chihuahua's face hardened. An expression as if it had finally come. Vikir explained it easily. Therefore. You're asking to see some of the farting people in the community, right? You're right. The youth group of the county office is made up of local officials, especially the second and third generation of powerful influential families. They are asking to see Vikir among other small families within the Baskerville family's territory, a group of young people from indigenous families who have exercised influence in the area for a long time. Most of them are directly or indirectly related to the Baskervilles, and in many cases they are maternal relatives, and sometimes they are connected by regional or school ties. The Chihuahua spoke with a hint of contempt in his voice that he could not fully hide even if he tried to hide it. It is said to be the local youth autonomy committee, but in reality it is just a promiscuous social club. It looks like the young masters over there have something to say about the Vikir special law. Hmm. After hearing those words, Bakir rested his chin and leaned back on the sofa. When a law is made to eradicate absurdity, the place with the most noise is the most corrupt. The backlash against the Vikir special law was heard for the first time. It came from the Autonomous Council. Vikir spoke briefly to the Chihuahua, 
who was looking at him with an anxious expression. The dung flies smelled it first. Didn't you know that would happen and have been laying down shit since day one of your appointment? Now is the time to catch the pests that are eating away at the city. Episode 32 Social Club, 1. A large high-rise hotel in the center of Underdog City. There is a large club on the 69th and 70th floors. Burning Suspension. Underdog A high-end social club where the city's brightest people gather. Here, rich and powerful young people gather to burn off their youth. Ultra-expensive champagnes worth 100 million gold a bottle were being flown in one after another, and exciting music with a fast tempo was playing every day. An unknown type of hookah creates a thick cloud of smoke and colorful lighting colors it. The atmosphere was so luxurious and extravagant that it was said to be a royal ball held at the imperial court. Ruler. Stack it up. Bring everything. Let's raise the tower again today. A room located in the deepest part of the club. In this room, which costs 10 million gold for six hours and is only accessible to VIPs, seven young masters were gathered together and playing. Champagne worth more than 100 million gold per bottle is delivered one after another while soaked in ice. In the center of the large table, champagne glasses were piled high in the shape of a pyramid. At the bottom, 100 glasses form a neat square shape of 10 by 10. On top of it are 81 champagne glasses in the shape of 9 by 9. On top of that are 64 8 by 8 champagne glasses. 49 above that, 36 above that, 25 above that, 16 above that, 9 above that, 4 above that. The pyramid-shaped champagne tower was completed when the last champagne glass was placed on top. The seven masters gathered here laugh and pour the 100 million gold bottle of champagne, Don Quixote Perignon 666, into the top champagne glass. Yet. Gulp gurgle. The champagne that filled the top glass began to drip into the glasses below, gradually filling them. If the bottle of champagne was empty along the way, the masters mercilessly threw it away and ordered a new drink. Yet. The champagne filled from the top glass gradually flows down to fill the glasses below. Thus, all 385 glasses that made up the champagne tower were full. Master Han said with a smile. Hey, you guys drink whatever spills on the table. Then the waiters standing at the entrance to the room came rushing over. Oh, thank you, brothers. Thanks to my brothers, I've been able to taste this precious liquor, and I'm really enjoying it. I will serve you with all my soul today. The waiters licked the champagne drops that spilled on the table with smiling faces. The masters laughed and threw gold coins in their faces. This is the trickle-down effect. Champagne flowed from the top, not only filling the glasses below, but also drenching the table, and the seven men laughing at it. These young masters were the core members of the local youth autonomy committee. Although it is only a private organization composed of the second or third generation of local emirs, governors, and powerful families, their influence in the local community cannot be ignored. Although he had a lot of money and had enough wealth and power to handle some low-level public affairs, he was still enough to reign over ordinary citizens as long as he was an aristocrat. Since the family had lived in this area for a long time, they were well-versed in observing the surrounding situation. So the Baskervilles also gave them a certain amount of power and gave them the authority to handle troublesome matters on their own. They also line up with the Baskervilles, inform them of the surrounding geography and public sentiment, and gain and exercise some degree of autonomy in return for paying a small amount of tribute and taxes. In fact, if we look at it historically, all of the young masters gathered here are merely descendants of out-of-date families that were defeated and demoted in the central power struggle of the empire. This means that everyone except the Baskervilles, who came to expand the border under a special order from the emperor, is of no particular interest. But the young people gathered here didn't seem to think so. It is better to be the head of a snake than the tail of a dragon. In fact, you say it's better to have fun here, out of the eyes of the imperial family. That's right. Last time I went to a club in the imperial capital, this one was much more extravagant. What's more, those Baskervilles are protecting this place. How safe is it? Giggle giggle, isn't Baskerville our hunting dog at this point? The young masters who did not know much about the world were very immature. While the Baskervilles were concentrating only on expanding their borders, they were stagnating inside and rotting away. 
So where do they get the financial power to spend such extravagant and debaucherous fun? The main source of income for local powerful families is actually quite unremarkable. At most, water tax from reservoirs for irrigating farmland, road use tax, toll tax, payment for selling livestock even if it is an expense, it is only a small amount of compensation to be distributed to the butlers and serfs. Both the money going out and the money coming in are small, but in fact, they had a hidden source of income. Illegal slave auction. Those who do not have permission from the government are kidnapped, imprisoned, and then sold into slavery. Recently, as the number of barbarian people who lost their villages has been increasing due to the Baskerville family's active territory development, human trafficking in which people are secretly tricked and seduced or kidnapped by force and sold is rampant. In short, it is free riding on the Baskerville family's business and picking up crumbs. Since no taxes are paid and transaction volume is steady, money naturally accumulates. Young masters play with their youth using the black money they earn. Since the money was earned illegally, I couldn't put it in the bank, so I burned it all with a cash grab. The champagne tower is full. Go get the kids in. Bring the kids who sleep well. The masters dismissed the waiters for a while. And then we started whispering among ourselves. Anyway, it's really nice to see an upright family like Mesanadna disappear. You can play like this without paying attention. Actually, that's natural. They say we play with our own money. It was a good thing they framed you and sent you away. Yes. Let's not have those guys as members from now on. They looked listless as they smoked bubbling hookahs. One of them suddenly raised his head. Oh. But have you heard the news about the new deputy consul? Oh, I already put in a request for an interview. I heard it was Mr. Ban's last name. Hmm. Is it Chaff? If it's ban, it means you're a collateral or an illegitimate child. You should consider it an honor to be called by us. He 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 he, he's going to come running in a huff again. When new vice consuls arrive, they always do something called, training junior officials. There's nothing special about it, it's just that they show you an extravagant party that will make you lose your senses. And it meant putting the dog on a leash with the feeling that, if you're going to follow us to places like this in the future, you have to listen to us carefully. The masters laughed. I heard your name is Vakir. Have you ever heard of it? I don't know, this is my first time hearing it. I'm fifteen years old. I heard this is your first time coming out of the family. What? You're such a kid, right? That's right, it's a kid. I heard that as soon as you first came to City Hall, you started drinking a lot. I guess he's quite the idiot. Kyuk-kyuk, you'll fit in well with us then. At that time, one of the masters suddenly came up with an interesting idea. Would you like to have a little fun with us so we can get the momentum going? He extended his index finger and explained his plan. Let's throw a big party later and invite him. Let's have some really top quality drinks, invite all the girls, and have fun for the first time in a while. And? And then later, after the party is over, I tell him to pay for the drinks. At those words, the masters burst out laughing. Good, good, that sounds fun. Aren't your eyes popping out when you see Bilge? You should know that your brother spends such a large amount of money to entertain you. If you take it for granted later, you'll go. Where can a fifteen-year-old civil servant have money? If I report it to my family, I'm afraid I'll be scolded and I won't be able to find anywhere to get money. And later you can tell me it was a joke and pay me. How will the priests trouble the newly appointed deputy consul, and how will they roast him? Right then. Hang them. The women are here. The waiter opened the door and came in with a bright smile on his face. Soon, numerous women look into the club room and are amazed at its extravagance. There seem to be some familiar faces among them, and the masters waved their hands happily. Hey, are you here again? Even after being treated like that? Take him out. We're excited, wow. Why? I like her because she's pretty. Hey. Come sit here this time. One by one, the women entered the room. However. There was something strange stuck at the end of the women coming in. Maybe he was just in his early teens. A boy who looks quite young. 
The way the women followed into the room from behind was so natural that even the waiters didn't do anything to stop them. After scanning the women and making crude jokes, the seven masters finally found the boy. But what is he? Did you call the male receptionist too? Well, he did look cute. Yes. Oh, you don't know anyone. You don't know. Then the masters, the waiters, and the women all made blank expressions. What is this kid that followed me here? A waiter touched his forehead. I came in so confidently that no one thought it was strange. You fucking slut. How dare the young man ask where this is? But he couldn't fully extend his hand to grab the boy's hair. Wow. The sound of something thick and hard being broken. Only then did the waiter notice that his wrist was turned in a strange direction. You. The boy broke the adult man's thick forearm using only his grip strength. W. What is this guy? Three or four waiters attacked at once, but it took less than a second for them all to fall to the floor. The young master's expressions hardened slightly. What is this little guy? Hey, what are you doing here? Do you know who your brothers are? No. There is no emotion in the boy's voice. They're idiots from Haiyangcheng. Completely emotionless, with no feelings of respect, fear, servility, or even contempt. At those words, the masters were dazed for a moment. Before long, they laughed boisterously. That's right. If they are idiots from Haiyangchen, then we are right. It looks like they know who we are. Then we just need to know who he is. Kid. Who are you? The young masters were debating whether this situation, which had happened for the first time in a while, was amusing. But. At the boys' next words, the smiles disappeared from their faces. Vikir. Newly appointed deputy consul. Vikir van Baskerville is here. The masters gently lowered their feet from the table. Then he stood up hesitantly and asked. Wealth consul. What's going on here? You guys called it. Hearing Vikir's words, the masters looked blank once more. Then. Wahahahaha, this is hot, deputy consul. I never thought you would come right away like this. The atmosphere is not very good. Moreover, the young masters who had just been insulted had their high self-esteem hurt. Shall we start training the new recruits right away? Okay. Why don't you spend some time paying for the drinks? First of all, if you boil it well and have them sit down, then at the end of the party, if you ask them to pay for the drinks? But. Their cute plan never came to fruition. Widely. Bikir put his hand on the table. And. Tsutsutsutsu. The Baskerville family's unique dark red aura is creeping up. The mana contained within Bikir's body spread out onto the table through his hands. That fierce resonance, violent vibration. Bubbly, bubbling, bubbling. The champagne in the glasses on the table suddenly began to boil. Yet. A change occurred in the large champagne tower in the center. Hakon. One glass at the top of the champagne tower suddenly exploded. Below, countless glass shards and champagne drops sparkle and scatter. Clink. 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 The four glasses downstairs. The nine glasses downstairs. The sixteen glasses downstairs. The twenty-five glasses downstairs. The thirty-six glasses downstairs. The forty-nine glasses downstairs. The sixty-four glasses downstairs. The eighty-one glasses downstairs. All one hundred glasses downstairs exploded and shattered one after another. The champagne tower collapsed. Instead of collapsing from below, it exploded from above. Patter 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 patter. Countless glass dust and champagne drops fall like a shower inside the VVIP room. In the face of the rain, the young masters of Sedoga had no choice but to say a word. We were going to pay for the drinks. Episode 33, Social Club, 2. The seven masters gathered in the VVIP room were all smart and cruel. Montblanc family, Pierre family, Louis family, Channel family, Ferragamo family, 
Hermes family, Prada family. The seven indigenous families of the region they belong to have lived without paying attention to anyone except the Baskervilles. Even those from the Baskervilles were persuaded by their strong financial power and the public sentiment behind them, and became friendly relations. Up until now, life had never gone their way, so of course they thought this time would be similar. So it is true that I played a little mischievous prank this time. But. This time things were something different. Patter 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 patter. Countless glass dust and champagne drops fall like a shower inside the VVIP room. Glass powder and boiling champagne reflecting brilliant light from the chandelier. The seven masters of the seven families, whose entire bodies were drenched by the sharp and hot shower, looked dazed. Did you just blow up the champagne tower with mana resonance? Just by touching the table? And not from the bottom up, but from the top down? Since they were all young masters with their own basic knowledge of martial arts, I could see how absurd the phenomenon that Vakir had created was. Being able to pour mana into an object to cause vibration due to resonance and explode it at exactly the desired point is not something that can be achieved with ordinary mana mastery. Even the glass broke from the top, not the bottom. The fact that the glass next to the table is intact but the glass above it is broken is something that only an expert in the multiplication method can do. And the fact that the direction of action is vertical rather than horizontal doubles the difficulty. In other words, it means that the stems of mana, which are much thinner and more detailed than microfiber, can be freely manipulated like limbs. Ultra difficulty mana management. The realm of real guys. Everyone's mind is filled with only one thought. Graduator. Monsters that swing their swords to cut rocks the size of houses and kill flying birds by dropping them with just the force of their force. Aren't these young masters, barely at the lower level of expert, absolute powerhouses that we can't even dare to do anything about? The Kier's expression is still expressionless. However, the dark red aura oozing from both shoulders resembles that of the Grim Reaper. If death had a distinct form, wouldn't it look like this now? The cadets who were trying to harass Bakir began shivering, drenched in a shower of champagne. Crazy. He's a 15-year-old kid. Hey. You are at expert intermediate level. Do something. Shut up. If I fight back, I won't be able to last even a second. While urgent glances were exchanged, one master muttered in a dazed voice. Yeah, yeah. Bakir. I wonder where I've heard this before. At those words, the master's eyes turned to one side. He spoke in a stuttering tone. Vikir van Baskerville. Supernova of the Baskervilles. As soon as he was born, he dived for seven minutes, strangled two poisonous snakes in his cradle, hunted Cerberus at the age of eight, and sparred with and defeated the Morgue family sorceress. Then the expressions on the other master's faces changed as if they had heard some absurd urban legend. But but what if they are really true? The young master's eyes now turned to Vakir again. Graduator symbol, an aura as sticky as liquid. If that urban legend is not true, there is no way to explain this deathly energy rising from Vakir's entire body. My goodness, what 15-year-old kid in this world has already reached the level of a graduate at that age? Even in the Baskervilles, where only geniuses gather, there has never been a case like this before. The same would probably be true if you searched the Imperial Academy, Colossio, or even the entire Imperial Capital. In the end, the masters had no choice but to say something with an awkward smile. We were going to pay for the drinks. Are we aware that the servile smile we always saw engraved on other people's faces is now engraved on our own faces? Meanwhile, Vikir, who heard those words, answered indifferently. Of course you have to pay for the alcohol you drank. The seven young masters who heard those words kept their mouths shut. Oh. We haven't eaten together yet. I accidentally told him in advance about my plan to make trouble. Still, since it wasn't Meg yet, I thought I could just get over it if I made a good excuse. That is, if the opponent wasn't Bakir. Although he is only fifteen years old, he is a veteran whose soul is already worn out. Bakir immediately realized what these seven masters were trying to do. Why? Were you planning on charging me for drinks after hanging out together? The seven young masters jumped and shook their heads in response to Vakir's question, which was like a ghost, grasping the pulse and snatching it. 
Well, that can't be possible. Who would do such a shameless thing? How dare you tell someone from the Baskervilles that we... The Seven Masters felt it. The opponent is not just strong in combat. Sinji was also someone who could never be taken lightly. Eventually they gave up. They were so arrogant that they dared to think of Baskerville as their dog, but when they actually stood in front of Vakir, they couldn't think of such insolence. It seems that the Baskerville hound cannot be easily roasted or boiled. However, the pride they had built up while showing off their power as second-generation members of a local maintenance family led them to save their last bit of face until the very end. Actually, we wanted to test you, Vice Consul. The masters calmed their countenances and spoke in a polite manner. Vikir still has an expressionless face. The masters, who understood the silence to mean, let's hear it, pretended to be relaxed and continued speaking in a polite tone. Honestly, Underdog City is very corrupt, isn't it? I thought that anyone who would cleanse a city like this should not give in to this level of temptation. You are truly qualified to lead us. I will follow. Oh, please let me use this great spirit as a lesson for the rest of my life. I will express this emotion of today in a way that you will not be disappointed in the future. They bowed their heads to Vakir once again and spoke in serious voices. Among them, there was one who pretended to be calm and winked at Vakir. Okay. One corner of Vakir's mouth slowly rises. Smile. This small change completely changed the atmosphere of the room. Just a moment ago, it was like an eerie graveside atmosphere. And that alone made the seven masters feel quite scared. But what now? The pressure of going crazy. A suffocating pressure began to weigh on the seven masters, as if they had been buried alive in an earthen tomb. They were unable to breathe properly and began to tremble, completely losing the smile on their faces. Bikir walked slowly in front of the seven young masters, who were unable to move like frogs trapped in a snake's stomach. The owner can test the dog as much as he wants. But not the other way around. A dog cannot test its owner. Under any circumstances. It was a moment when Hugo's teachings from a long time ago came to mind. Vikir walked slowly in front of the frozen masters. There's nothing to be afraid of because you have a lot of money and power, right? Naturally, there was no answer. Vikir continued. It's because I've never seen anything truly scary. So, I dare you to pretend to have expected it all, to be gentle, and to be relaxed. And the price of that, pretend, was heavy. Vikir took out a small club from his arms. It was the same stake that had won the girl 10 billion won in prize money not long ago. Pow! Dull noise. The stake seemed to bend for a moment, and then flew at an incredible speed, crushing the face of the young master in front with a blood clot. A blow that started suddenly and without end. Teeth are falling out, and spit, blood, tears, and snot are splattering. Vikir struck the master's face, head, neck, and shoulders seven times in the span of three blinks, and did the same to the other masters. Soon, all the young masters were spread out flat on the floor of the VVIP room like a land battle. Puck. Pow. Puck. Simplicity and honesty. Crash. Vikir did not stop swinging the stick for some time after that. Do you know why you are right? Ugh. I don't know. I don't know. Why are you hitting me all of a sudden? If you don't know, you should be right. Vikir swings a stake in an indifferent tone. The young masters who saw that expressionless face thought that they might really die if things continued like this. Oh, I know. Ugh, I think I know why you're hitting me. The dogs desperately prayed with their burst lips, torn tongues, and broken teeth. This is while appealing to the red blood gushing out like a fountain from all over the head. However, the owner who sees it still looks unimpressed. If you know, take it sweetly. Vikir's club doesn't stop even at the red light. Episode 34, Social Club, 3 The rumor spread quickly. It is said that seven gangs who boasted that they were doing well but were engaging in extravagance and evil were arrested at once. Citizens of Underdog City always talked about that when groups of three or more gathered together. Well, they tried to rope in the new deputy consul, but they were defeated. Ugh, aren't they the ones who treat ordinary people like bugs? 
I met the owner this time. But what will happen to them? Looking at the personality of the new consul, it seems that he is not normal. You're not going to just be released, are you? Oh, anyway, they are the second generation of an indigenous family. I'll just humiliate him a little bit and let him go. The people who were talking naturally turned their heads. In the northern part of the central square, banners were still waving in the wind. Article 00, Paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law to prohibit illegal human trafficking sentence, death penalty. Article 00, Paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law against illegal gambling sentence, wrist amputation. Article 00, Paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law on prohibiting illegal private financing sentence, by extraction. Article 00, Paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law on banning illegal entertainment establishment sentence, facial tattoo. Article 00, Paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law against illegal lobbying sentence, expulsion from the territory. It is the same as the first one attached. There were no exceptions to the law. No matter where you look, there is no special clause that says those with a lot of money will be tolerated or those with power will be forgiven. The crimes of the seven arrested masters were extremely clear. He entered illegal entertainment establishments, illegally lobbied, illegally trafficked people, consumed and distributed drugs, and made unfair profits in the process. Tax evasion, assault, and sexual assault were natural options. Therefore, the sentence is also clear. Death penalty. It is a penalty that cannot be escaped by any excuses or extenuating circumstances. People were whispering. You really want to execute the children of those seven indigenous families? You fool, don't you know the personality of the new deputy consul? This is a person who burned ten billion won on a single stake. But anyway, if I killed those seven bastards in the world, the aftereffects wouldn't be a joke. Wouldn't it be just a matter of hitting me with a club and humiliating me? Okay. No matter what, I don't think it will lead to the death penalty. Everyone spoke in unison. This is a power game between the new politicians and the indigenous wealthy people, and if the indigenous wealthy people bow their heads and bow their heads, everything will work out smoothly. And, as people expected, the Mont Blanc, Pierre, Louis, Channel, Ferragamo, Hermes, and Prada families expressed their sincere apologies to the new vice consul. Local officials gave in and went in. Citizens clicked their tongues when they saw carriages symbolizing each family going to City Hall under the cover of night, loaded with colorful tributes. Now, the seven imprisoned bastards will be released unharmed and will hear a harsh word from their father, the head of the family. That's it. The local officials will somehow take revenge on this humiliation, or they will bow down and watch what others think, and the seven idiots will stay quiet for a while while maintaining discipline. The newly appointed young vice consul achieved a wonderful victory over the indigenous wealthy people. Citizens will also be moderately relieved, moderately angry, and moderately forgetful of this obvious result. It will happen. No, I thought that would happen. Until this morning, when seven heads were hung in the middle of the central square. Seven heads that were preserved in salt. Those who had lost their bodies and only their heads remained were distorted as if they had suffered from terrible pain right before they died. If you look at the notice hung under the head, it details the additional punishments they received before they died, that is, before receiving the death penalty. Article 00, Paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law on banning illegal entertainment establishment sentence, facial tattoo. Executed in accordance with the above law, the word, color, is tattooed on the entire face. Article 00, paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law against illegal gambling sentence, wrist amputation. Executed in accordance with the above law, both wrists are amputated. However, the number of times the law was violated is applied retroactively, so even after cutting the wrist, additional cuts are made at a certain length. This prisoner received 72 wrist amputations. Article 00, Paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law on prohibiting illegal private financing sentence, by extraction. Executed without leniency, 
taking into account the petitions of those who were harmed by these prisoners. Article 00, Paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law to prohibit illegal human trafficking sentence, death penalty. Executed according to the law. Article 00, Paragraph 0 of the Baskerville Family Dominion Constitution. Law against illegal lobbying sentence, expulsion from the territory. Because he was already a dead person, only his body, excluding his head, was expelled outside the castle walls. Citizens had no choice but to gape. Since the law itself was originally in place, there is no need to think of it as excessive or strict. However, the problem was that the prisoners to whom the law was applied were not the ordinary prisoners who had been there for a long time. It's not just a power game. This is a battle of destruction that lasts until one of the two disappears. No one could have predicted that there would be a bloody storm. Not long before the sentence was carried out. Bikir was standing in front of the bars of the dungeon. And inside the prison, you can see the seven cadets groaning and covered in blood. You, this Sankey, who Abuja hate, I'll tell you everything. I'm afraid to go out. How can I get there? Lord, forgive me for abandoning you. And in front of him, the Chihuahua Baskerville was standing restlessly. Oh my, assistant consul. Why did you beat them like this? Even though he said that, he seemed a bit refreshed. Vikir, who was standing expressionless next to him, suddenly turned his head. Do you think what I did to these people was excessive? Yes. Oh well, of course. Even if you beat them, you should have beaten them in moderation. If you turn people into meat pancakes like this, how are you going to handle it later? Then Vikir smiled. Do not worry. It hasn't even started yet. Yes. The Chihuahua asks with a puzzled expression. Vikir thought without answering. The local office originally played the role of checking and supervising local evil officials, educating the local community, and coordinating the relationship with the city hall. However, as time passed, they became more and more like a corrupt person, and were now even trying to surpass the power of the male Baskerville family. The bail won't do. Leave it alone. On the subject of Wang Jin's bastard family. Even more so when you see it growling like this. However, Bakir, who was on the receiving end of their hatred, did not seem to care at all. When the sun sets, we will execute them all. At those words, the masters inside the bars fell silent at once. Vikir spoke once more. While I'm at it, I'll annihilate everyone, from the babes in the club to the devils on the streets. Those terrifying words were definitely true. Everything will be done 100% according to the words, without any error. A war on crime has been declared. The masters looked blank for a moment, but now they urgently grabbed the bars and started shaking them. Come on, let's go. Haberma. Haberman Bajusi. It's all in the sunset. Moxamang Sariajusi. People who normally look at others like bugs are now crawling on the floor like bugs. As a result, the Chihuahua was feeling complex, unknown emotions. Will there ever be anything more exhilarating like this in my lifetime? However, on the other hand, there was fear of retaliation from local indigenous powers. Their revenge is both cruel and fatal. It was clear that no sponsors would come to the projects hosted by Vakir in the future, and the number of people attending the events it hosted would be very low. Trade with other cities was at a disadvantage, and tax revenues were also likely to decrease. But Vakir was so calm. It's like a person who has all the necessary measures in place. There's nothing to worry about, manager. Ha, but. Their family will not be able to protest. Yeah. Why? Vikir answered the Chihuahua's questions unusually willingly. They are involved in large and small criminal groups in Underdog City. Yes. How could the Consul General do that? Since he couldn't say he saw it before returning, Vikir kept his mouth shut. Then the Chihuahua said as if he was worried. But isn't the evidence what's important? And even if evidence comes out, what kind of retaliation will they have in the future? Don't worry, there are all of them. Vikir laughed. You just have to find the evidence. If you can't find it, just make it. And everything that happened afterward was out of Vikir's interest. 
because Bakir was thinking of leaving for another place soon. I don't know who his successor will be, but he'll have a hard time. I don't think Hugo will hold the position of vice consul for long. In a world that will soon undergo upheaval, there is a high possibility that it will be deployed into actual battlefields in the near future. So, even if he got into a bit of a fight and lost his temper right now, it didn't really matter to Vakir's future. At least as soon as I entered the academy, I had to leave here. Therefore, it is a good idea to solidify discipline at least once while serving as vice consul. The answer is to prescribe a drug with strong efficacy even if it has some side effects. This would soon lead to fame and further enhance Bakir's career. Whoever came as his successor in the future was not something to worry about. Because Bakir hated members of the same Baskerville family the most. But the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. In order to do so, these seven battles before our eyes know, we need to make the young masters reveal all the evidence of their collusion with criminal groups, and even their locations. Bakir went to the bars and said. Let me tell you what your charges are. Women were illegally kidnapped and imprisoned, sexually assaulted, blackmailed, forced to administer illegal drugs, human trafficked, and even induced into prostitution, and officials were bribed, blackmailed, intimidated, contracted assaults, and even murdered. Then the young master struggled. Well, that's an enemy attack. Once the evidence comes, I will punish you. If you have evidence, you will be punished. Are you saying that there is a crime but no evidence? Well, that. The young masters look at each other and mumble. And soon a determined look is exchanged. Even if I end up dying here, I won't cause any harm to the family. If we blow it all up here, we can't expect revenge. The family would kick them out, and even if they kicked them out, looking at the personality of Vakir and that psycho, they might go further and apply the guilt by association system to the families and uproot the pillars. Never. I'll never tell you. The seven bastards kept their mouths shut, ready to sacrifice themselves for their family. But. Oh, you're finally here. Vikir waved his hand toward the entrance in the dungeon hallway. It seems that the reason I was standing in front of the bars until now was to wait for someone. The seven masters follow Vikir's gaze with curiosity and anxiety. And there, a stooped old man was walking carrying a large basket. Your custom order has been completed, Nori. The old man was a torture technician working in the basement of City Hall. Yet. Bakir turned the basket over and spilled its contents onto the shelf. Char. What came out of it were over hundreds of knives. All of them were bizarre and hideously curved, twisted, distorted, blocky, and scratchy. The old torturer smiled, showing his yellow teeth. Wow, there are a lot of organizations that I have never seen before, even though I have been doing torture for the past 30 years. How on earth did you come up with these creepy devices? It's not something I invented myself. These were common tools where I was. Hal 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 hal, is the place you were before even hell? Well, it was similar. Would you like to learn something? Uh, I decline. Looking at the tools, I can roughly guess how to use them, no matter how much I do, I feel like I'm going to vomit up everything I ate when I see those tools being used. These torture devices are so terrifying that even torture technicians who have been practicing torture for 30 years are speechless. Vikir held them and walked back to the bars. Heek. The seven masters instinctively felt something and crawled away from the bars. But in a cruel way. Clap. Bakir opened the bar without hesitation and came inside. Remembering the faces of my old colleagues before returning. I miss you. In front of those guys' torture techniques, the demon prisoners also spewed out military secrets. Even the devils who came up from hell cried and urinated, which was the torture technique of the Age of Destruction. As Vakir, who knows all about the future torture techniques that have developed dramatically in a short period of time while dealing with demons, he can't help but find the resolute facial expressions in front of him cute. You have an expression that says you will never blow. Vakir continued speaking with a faint smile. Please don't blow. This was sincere. This is because I wanted to feel the memories and nostalgia of the past for a long time. Episode 35 Auction House Flowers, 1. Night. The outskirts of Underdog City. 
For some reason, luxury carriages are flocking to a vacant lot in the back where no one usually comes. A black tent covered the entire large vacant lot. Masked nobles and wealthy people entered the barracks with a swagger. Today is the day of the slave auction. Of course, this is a slave auction that was not officially reported to the Baskervilles. Therefore, the slaves exhibited here are undeclared products. Originally, there were many people who could not have been traded as slaves. For example, barbarians who lost their hometown, nobles from a distant region, or commoners who were suddenly kidnapped one day. They are beings who have been chained and manipulated with whips or drugs, so their will to run away or report has been completely broken. Or they were products that would become like that in the future. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to tonight's freak show. Yes, please come, welcome. A clown dressed as a clown welcomes visitors. Soon, a middle-aged man walked in front of the clown. A middle-aged man with a long goatee and a somewhat sly appearance was constantly looking around, wondering what was so unsettling. The clown checked the middle-aged man's pass. Hmm <laughs> hmm. Mr. Chihuahua Montblanc. Oh, so you come from the Montblanc family? This stylish signature handwriting is a Montblanc exclusive patent that no one can imitate. Oh. The clown caught a middle-aged chihuahua named Montblanc while trying to let him pass. The chihuahua is visibly upset. The clown narrowed his eyes at him and said. Looking at the purpose of the visit written on the certificate, it was not to buy slaves, it says you came to sell. Ah. Exactly. I'm here to sell. What about the property? Yes. Well, I tied it up back there for a while. There is only one anyway. He's a young guy, so he doesn't take up much space. Then the clown smiled and lowered his head again. Okay. Montblanc people are blue chip customers who always purchase slaves in large quantities. This time, since you came to sell them, I was worried that they might be selling them because they didn't like the ones they bought last time, so I asked. The chihuahua wiped his cold sweat with a handkerchief and nodded. That's not true. I am always satisfied with the quality of the slaves I buy here. Yes. You're right. We only sell carefully selected slaves. They kidnap barbarian women who have lost their families and hometowns, commoners, and noble daughters visiting from distant regions and train them harshly without them knowing. They are obedient in everything and cannot even dream of running away or rebelling. Quality is guaranteed. The clown politely bowed his head again to the chihuahua and spoke. Welcome to the freak show. There was a strange tension inside the auction house. Under a cloud of hookah and tobacco smoke, masked men and women sit around the central stage. Underdog, the wealthy people who run the underground economy are all gathered here. A noblewoman wearing a butterfly mask whets her appetite while looking at a naked barbarian male slave on stage, and a gentleman wearing a bat mask whets his appetite looking at a mercenary male slave on stage. There was no distinct public in the things that came up on the auction house stage. Objects such as old jars, famous works of art, and sharp treasured swords were brought up, and sometimes rare animals or demonic beasts were brought up, and people branded as slaves were also brought up. However, for the rich people gathered here, such distinction is probably good. Because they are people who usually treat objects, animals, and people as the same. The masked VIPs were talking among themselves with their mouths covered with fans. I heard it's popular these days in the imperial capital to capture strange-looking slaves and display them. I'm not really interested in those trends. A slave just needs to be pretty and handsome. If you're a slave, shouldn't you be good at working or fighting? Ha ha ha, I'm drawn to the tragic past of slaves. That's why I prefer people from fallen nobles or kidnapped nobles. Well, anyway. I hope there are many useful slaves today. Most people's attention was directed toward slaves. A host dressed as a clown stands on stage and shouts at the top of his voice. Yes. This sword and shield are clearly relics of an ancient civilization. Thirty million gold has arrived. Do you have any more? Yes then the bid was successful. Applause for the snake-masked man over there who will take this lucky weapon. Come on, here's the next listing. Everyone. Look at this beautiful jewel-encrusted crown. 
It must have been used by a king of a fallen kingdom somewhere in the history books. At that time, the attention of the audience, which had been focused only on the slaves, suddenly focused on one place. Although the item for sale this time was not a person, it was still enough to attract all the attention in the market for an instant. A black buffalo covered in black muscles. It has huge horns, a massive body, and three shiny red eyes. Hell Buffalo, Murcielago. Risk level, A. Size, 3M. Location of discovery, Red and Black Mountains Part 2 Ridge. A type of cow that lives in the oil world deep in hell. It is said to have 19 hearts and will not stop charging until all of them stop. It was a huge demonic beast that inhabited the Red and Black Mountains. But the reason why no one runs away even when this monster appears on stage is simple. Because this Murcielago was dead. The host shouted. Ruler. This item was secretly embezzled from hunting by the knights of the Baskerville family. That precious a rank dangerous monster. Hide, meat, bones, intestines, there's nothing to throw away. The hell buffalo had nineteen wounds on its body. It seems that death occurred only after all hearts were destroyed. The price of these corpses soon began to skyrocket. One hundred million gold. 120 million. 140 million. 190 million. 200 million. 250 million. Even though they are not human slaves, the entire auction house heats up. The host, who sold the carcass of a hellish buffalo at a good price, led the auction in earnest to see if excitement was rising. Ruler. From now on, it's auction time for only humans and similar humans. Soon, various types of people began to come up on stage. A barbarian man with dead eyes as if he has given up on everything, a kidnapped noblewoman crying and begging to be sent back home, a terrified commoner boy as if he still has no idea where he is, and a fallen nobleman screaming to be killed. Daughter of 1 million 200 million 250 million Get 7,000 more I wanted that bitch no one can touch it. You're laughing. Bring more money. The more they cry, scream, and give up, the more the madness of the humans surrounding the stage grows. Right then. The host, who was excited about the items being actively sold, suddenly looks embarrassed. Uh. Ha. Huh. Are you putting this up for sale too? Yes. Really? Ah, uh, I see. I'll see if I sell it first. He seems to be having trouble communicating with the men backstage. Yet. He calms his expression and speaks again. Ruler. The next listing is a little different from the previous ones. A unique charm. This is a product that still has plenty of room for improvement. That means that even slave traders are not yet well controlled. After painstakingly finishing the packaging, the host dragged the slave to the center of the stage. Unlike before, this time the slave came on stage locked in a strong iron cage. Kaa walk. Screams erupt one after another. Inside the cage, a barbarian girl with a black face was running wild. Is he about seventeen years old now? He had black hair with scattered silver hair, pointed ear tips shaped like triangles, and a black face that was covered in ash, so it originally appeared to be light brown. He was wearing a choker with thorns around his neck, and the animal skin he was wearing as clothing was nothing more than a piece of rag. The body visible through the rags was solid and slim, but its face was unrecognizable because it was covered in ash, and it was running and growling so violently that no one held up a bit sign. Unintelligible sound. A language I don't understand at all. Moreover, the noble ladies were turning their heads with frowns due to the smell of wild animals wafting across the stage and the body odor as if they had not washed for dozens of days. Ah, uh, who buys this? Even society's clowns talk to themselves like this, so I've said it all. Still, since he was in a position where he had to sell something, he did his best to deliver a message. Ego. Ruler. It is said that slave traders picked up something that had fallen deep in the jungle. Come on, don't do that. Wouldn't it be nice to tame such a fierce slave again? Whether you serve him as a knight attendant or a gladiator. 
It's time to prove your slave training skills. We'll start with a bid of five million. Ruler. Start. But no one raises their hand. Usually, there is someone who calls out the lowest bid considering the MC's reputation and the atmosphere of the auction house this time there wasn't even that. 8. Then I'll lower the minimum bid. 3 million. Don't you have 3 million? Then you won't even get your money's worth. 2 million. Now, we're taking you to 2 million. I'll tell you once again, we can't even break even. I understand, I understand. 1 million. Close your eyes and go to 1 million. Take it, boil it for human meat, and eat it. We only sell the meat by the price of the meat. But in the end, no one raised their hand. The host grumbled and gestured. It's okay. This isn't selling. I told you, only post guaranteed products. No way. Get it off stage quickly. Next time, I'll have to use a wind catcher or something. Soon the slavers came up on stage and pulled down the iron bars where the barbarian girl was imprisoned. In the midst of this, the girl even had a serious accident by biting off the fingers of the merchant who was holding the iron bars and cutting them off. The atmosphere at the auction house became chaotic. The organizers had to somehow control this atmosphere. Is that why? The host felt that it was time to bring out the secret S-class item. Ruler. Fist. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. From now on, focus your attention. In my subjective judgment, the best listings today are available right now. Yet. A man appeared on stage. A boy with handcuffs and heavy chains hanging from his wrists. A youthful face that looks like it has just turned 15 years old. Even though the restraints must be heavy, the boy's gait is unhesitating. A faint admiration flowed from the audience at his confident and calm demeanor. Eventually, as the boy stands in the center of the stage, the torch lights above illuminate his face. The boy's appearance clearly revealed in a bright halo of light. And the audience who saw that all fell silent. Oh. The expressions on the faces of all the noble ladies and some middle-aged men gathered here were becoming hazy. Episode 36 Slave Auction, 2 the appearance of the slave boy who came up on stage made the hall quiet for an instant. Cheeks that haven't completely lost fat yet, but still a sharp jawline. A sharp nose, tightly closed bright red lips, straight dark eyebrows and long eyelashes. Plus that precious black hair and red eyes. Her half-naked body was healthy and tanned, but looking at the traces of white underwear here and there, it appears that she originally had white skin without any blemishes. The boy's beauty was shining just by adding the basic makeup applied to the slaves on stage. Vikir. Vikir Van Baskerville. He was on stage. The moderator said. Ruler. How are you? This item was listed at the end of the auction. The quality of the products is so good that we can expect a great competition. Sure enough, there is still silence beneath the stage. Even the barbarian girl in the cage, who had been running wild on the other side of the stage after losing the bid at the auction, became quiet and lost after Vakir appeared. At that time, someone held up a bidding sign. 600 million. A noble lady wearing a butterfly mask gasps. 600 million. No, 650 million. Then the middle-aged man on the other side jumped up as if he couldn't lose. 800 million. What? Aren't you the man? What does a man in 800 million have to do with anything? That's not it. What did the man want to use that kid for? Ha, huh, ha. Huh. What do you know? They want to use you as a gladiator. Wow. Do you think that slender kid can even hold a sword properly? Come on, you too. If you want to fight, go home and fight. I will ask for 900 million. I have 1 billion. 1.15 billion. 1.3 billion. 1.5 billion. A bloody price competition has begun. Now, the price of handmade products has started to rise by hundreds of millions. Just when the host is ecstatic as he calculates the fee. 6 billion. The amount was like a bomb. 
where everyone's eyes turn, they see a fat man eating his appetite. Um, the author. Baron Gambino of the Breadbasket. He's someone you rarely meet. You crazy guy, you've grown so much. I heard that he has recently increased his power by absorbing underground funds, but his financial power is truly amazing. People around me turn their heads with bitter expressions. Some of the noble ladies who were struggling with it suggested that they would raise money to confront him, but it was a long shot to deal with Baron Gambino, who was recently making a name for himself as a rising figure in the underworld. At that time. Baron. Wouldn't that be too much spending? The secretary next to Baron Gambino spoke. Wearing a short green blonde haircut and a monocle, she had a very cold and haughty look. Baron Gambino frowned slightly at his secretary's point, but then cleared his throat. Well, a slave that is that off-white can command a higher price in the capital of the empire. It's profitable to just buy it first and resell it later. Although he is a handsome boy, six billion seems a bit excessive. Moreover, isn't the story of when the baron bought that boy and left him alive with his body intact? Um. Koham. Baron Gambino glanced as if aware of the gaze around him, and then shouted. Shut up you bitch. I accepted something that had nowhere to go, and how dare you arrogantly stand on top of the owner's head. I like that kid. They say I live with my own money. When Baron Gambino shouted, the secretary sighed and shook her head. Yet. Baron Gambino, who won the bid for the item by paying a huge amount of money, smiled and brought Bakir with him. Soon, he raised his thick hand and started massaging Bakir's buttocks. With a new look on his face, Bakir looked alternately at Baron Gambino in front of him and at the hand that was kneading his buttocks. Baron Gambino chuckled as if he was satisfied when he saw Bakir's face, as if he had experienced something like this for the first time in his life. Why? Are you familiar with it? This will happen often from now on, so get used to it. Hee <laughs> hee, don't worry. I'll let you touch my butt as well. Later night. Baron Gambino said, looking over Vikir's body with a sinister expression. Right at that moment. Vikir raised his hands. Baron Gambino, who thought he was asking for the handcuffs to be released, laughed and was about to lift the key. Bye. Crack. The handcuffs in front of me were torn apart in the blink of an eye. Steel handcuffs that tear like sheets of paper. And chains. Bakir broke the restraints on his wrists with just the strength of his hands. And he held out both palms towards Baron Gambino, who was at a loss for words and had a blank expression on his face. Put your butt on it. I didn't even have time to resist or anything. Bakir easily flipped Baron Gambino's fat body over and grabbed his meaty buttocks with his hands. Damn it. A terrifying sound was heard, and soon Baron Gambino began screaming like he was slaughtering a pig. Kwa Haheya. The red blood fountain drenches the surroundings. The people around them started screaming as they saw a person being torn alive. Soon, the mercenaries in charge of guard began to rush forward. But. Tisk tisk tisk. The necks and bodies of the rushing guards were separated at once and rolled separately on the floor. As if he had already pulled it out, Bakir had a long black blade sticking out from his wrist. Buzz buzz buzz. The demon sword Beelzebub began to cry while sucking blood. Hit, hit. Catch him and kill him. The nobles even brought in their personal guards. Mercenaries and knights with drawn swords attacked with aura blooming. Tsutsut tsutsutsu. Vikir also radiated an aura. The swordsmanship that soon unfolds is the fifth type of Baskerville. Five ambush fish flew in at once and bit the necks of the enemies. Patter 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 patter. A shower of blood falls. Bodies that had lost their heads were falling to their knees and falling apart. The swordsmen behind them, who had barely escaped the disaster, could not help but be astonished. An aura as red and sticky as blood. Graduator. The ultimate weapon that represents a country's national power, a killing machine solely for killing. With each step Vakir took, he was sure to cut off one person's head. One step, one kill. One person dies with every step. The path that Vakir had walked was only a short distance of a dozen steps, but a shower of blood was already falling around him. 
everyone had only one thought in their heads. You don't stand a chance against Graduator. As soon as the swordsmen saw Vakir's aura dripping like liquid, they gave up their fight and began to retreat. But. You idiots. No matter how much I am a graduate, there is no business in Daguri. If you run now, you will all end up as slaves. Hey, so you're not going to make any money. Think of your family. The cries of nobles and wealthy people everywhere made some of the swordsmen turn away. Eventually, the confusion in the auction house calmed down to some extent. Before we knew it, hundreds of well-armed mercenaries had gathered and were surrounding Bakir. What on earth is that kid? How can you become a graduate at that age? Even the swordsmanship looks familiar, maybe Baskerville style. Are you human? What is it? Everyone looks confused, but the hostility is clear. Countless swords, spears, arrows, and magic surrounded Vakir in layers. No matter how strong the graduator was, there seemed to be no way to survive in the face of such intense fire. Even. This guy. Throw away your sword and surrender right now. Otherwise, your group will lose their lives. The clown on stage was threatening Vakir while holding him hostage. The person the clown was trying to stab in the neck with a knife was none other than Baskerville, a chihuahua. A chihuahua with a long goatee was trembling and looking at Vakir. Vakir stopped his actions for a moment and stood down. Then the mercenaries nearby point their swords and slowly narrow the siege. Right then. Assistant Consul. I am okay. Please take care of yourself. The chihuahua shouted with a determined expression. Soon, he grabbed the clown's arm and started pulling it towards his body. The clown was even more surprised by the chihuahua's actions of attempting suicide by stabbing himself in the neck with someone else's knife. You crazy guy. What are you doing? Let go. There is no compromise with injustice in my dictionary. Besides, it's better to die than to hinder your superiors. Is a line like that suitable for such a treacherous face? Let go. The clown and the chihuahua started bickering about whether they would kill or save each other. Vikir smiled softly at that sight. Yet. Sapung. Vikir, who sprayed a drop of aura and pierced the clown's eyebrows, picked up the fallen chihuahua and came down completely to the bottom of the stage. The surrounding area is full of life. Numerous mercenaries and knights from the local Sadoga were armed with swords, spears, arrows, and magic, staring at Vikir and Chihuahua. G. Assistant Consul. Would you mind? No matter how good the consul is at fighting, this number of people is a bit more over, you have a burden like me. The Chihuahua's concerns were justified. But Vikir remained calm. Don't worry. When leaving the Baskerville's mansion, he slightly tore the flesh of the thigh and took out what was hidden inside. It was a small whistle shaped like red teeth. There is a hidden card I received from the head of the family. Yet, Vikir brought the whistle, stained red with blood, to his mouth and blew. Beep. A high pitched tearing sound rang out. Those gathered around were tense and watching the center of the siege closely, not knowing what Vikir was doing. But. The incident actually started from the ceiling of the barracks, which no one was looking at. Whoops. There were shadows cutting through the curtain that stretched out like the night sky and intruding through the cracks. Countless black blood-like creatures fell from the sky. And. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Wherever they landed, blood broke out and people's heads fell off. Aya. What are these? More than a hundred people. Plus, everyone is a graduate. All one hundred people are graduates. Murderous weapons with an aura as red as blood on the tip of the sword. They instantly killed all the people at the front, then went behind Vakir and lined up politely. Eventually, those who managed to survive because they were in the rear were able to guess what the group of one hundred graduates that Vakir was leading was. Well, they couldn't be. I guess not. Probably not. Please please. Ah, uh, that's right. Who else would use symbols like that other than them? This could be immediately recognized by looking at the red tooth-shaped badge hanging on the chest. The Nightage Pit Bull, belonging to the Baskervilles. 
It was the appearance of a knighthood specializing in sweeping sweeps, said to be the most vicious not only in the Baskerville family but also in the entire empire. Bakir gave a short order to these fighting dogs who stood quietly in black cloaks. Bite them all and kill them. Episode 37 Slave Auction, 3 The method of eliminating the underground economy is indeed simple. It's about penetrating the core hidden between the dot tissue. Vikir repeated the line he had said to the Chihuahua. A place where underdog cities huge underground economy and the big players who control it gather in one place. Vikir already knew the place due to his knowledge before returning. However, it is impossible to defeat this large-scale organization alone. So Vikir had prepared for this in advance. Can I borrow it for once? A conversation with Hugo before leaving the Baskervilles. At that time, Bakir clearly said. Could I borrow the knights for once? After hearing this and thinking about it, Hugo gave permission. The right to freely operate an order of knights for half a day, that is, a piece of military power of the Baskerville family, was given away. I trust you won't do anything foolish. Son. Although it was limited, the implications of giving up military power were significant. This means that he will recognize Bakir as his son and treat him accordingly. In this way, the Pitbull Knights, one of the core forces driving the Baskerville family's military power, came under Vakir's control. All 100 of them were graduators, and the Iron Blood Knights, who were said to leave no survivors once deployed, became Vakir's hands and tribe for the next six hours. And now, Vakir is using this to sweep away all the corruption in the underdog city at once. Hugo was particularly sensitive to military power. I'm glad the pit bull was handed over safely. I thought that Hugo would not give up the knights easily due to his personality, which was extremely wary of local officials having private armies. But surprisingly, Hugo's trust in Bakir was strong, which made the job easier. Bakir glanced at the pit bull knights lined up behind him. Since ancient times, dog fighting does not allow dogs to show their teeth carelessly. Type 3 fighting dogs believe in their own strength and look down on their enemies. Second-class fighting dogs react too impatiently to the actions of their enemies. A first-class fighting dog has patience and composure, but the murderous look in his eyes is on the same level. And lastly, the fighting dog that is at the top does not react at all no matter how wild or threatening the enemy is, and is as calm as an inanimate object. The virtue of the wood ox. It's as if it was carved out of wood. In that respect, the pit bull knights can be seen as a very well-trained fighting dog group. They were now standing like blocks of wood behind Vikir, waiting for orders. Vikir gave them a start. Bite them all and kill them. Only then did the 100 pit bulls show their teeth. Vikir shouted at the fighting dogs running away. Do not kill those that are quietly lying down. But if he moves even a little, kill him mercilessly. It was a warning. Vikir's words were loud enough for the enemy to hear. Those who lost the will to fight quickly threw away their weapons and fell to the ground, raising their hands and feet up. But most people didn't. Aya. Ugh, help me. The head of the noble lady, who was screaming and trembling, is mercilessly cut off. I could see her fat head rolling under her red-stained fur coat. The middle-aged man who was running away had his internal organs spilling out on the spot. Regardless of whether they were men or women, everyone who ran away or screamed was dying. However, that did not mean that those who quietly bowed down were fine. Ugh, let's lie down first. Let's jump out as soon as the place gets a little quiet. Some people lay down on their stomachs on the floor and put their hands and feet up. It was a signal to wait for handcuffs. But. We don't carry handcuffs or anything like that. A pit bull knight approached them and grinned. The people lying on the ground were about to ask why their hands and feet were tied together. Awesome. Squeak. The pit bull knight's sword passed through their limbs. Wrists and ankles falling off in a patter. Aya. Aya. What are you doing? Those who were crawling on the floor and showing signs of running away suddenly stretched out like insects. Of course, the members of the pit bull knights attack other moving prey without any heed. Meanwhile, next to Vakir, a middle-aged man with black hair can be seen standing with a thick cigar in his mouth. 
He was an impressive man with a stocky body shaped like an inverted triangle, a square jaw, drooping cheeks, sunglasses covering his eyes, and scars covering his face. Count Boston Terrier Les Baskerville, leader of the Pitbull Knights, asks Fakir. My nephew. Are you satisfied? Yes uncle. He he he, guy. If there is anything else I can help you with, just let me know. He was quite fond of his nephew, Bakir, for no particular reason, but simply because he liked the fact that his petals were snappy. The Boston Terrier decided that since he was the nephew who was loved by the head of the family, Hugo, there was nothing wrong with building a close relationship with him. Vikir also didn't think too badly of the Boston Terrier, which purely pursues blood and fighting without any interest in power, honor, or political fighting. At that time, the Chihuahua next to me spoke in a trembling voice. Assistant Consul. But are you okay? They are nobles, so even if they cut off their wrists and ankles like that. What do you think? They are going to be executed soon anyway. It's a waste of handcuffs, so it's enough just to keep them from escaping like that. After hearing Vakir's answer, the Boston Terrier Count smiled as if he was even more satisfied. He he he, nephew. Be sure to join our pit bull nights later. Because this uncle will raise you properly. To this, Vakir simply responds with a faint smile. Finally, about a minute had passed since the pit bull nights stormed in, and the situation was completely over. Literally, a complete strike. All of the major villains in Underdog City were either killed or captured. Of course, there were those who did not attend by chance, but you can find out if you search through the ledgers and contact records of those caught. This this is truly an unprecedented achievement. It's absolutely gorgeous. The Chihuahua trembled with excitement as he watched criminals being taken away one after another in the distance. The war on crime was suddenly declared and ended surprisingly quickly. From now on, we have to clean up the remaining party members, but that kind of overtime work will be a piece of cake. Perhaps the indigenous families who lost their sons will also not be able to open their mouths about this incident. The future of Underdog City was clear, transparent, and bright. Congratulations. Now no one will dare challenge Bakir. The Chihuahua turned his head in joy. However, Bakir, who was supposed to hear the public address, had already left and disappeared a long time ago. I think it was like this. Vikir had already returned to the back of the auction house. A massacre is still taking place in front of the stage across the street. At about that time, Vikir slipped away without anyone noticing and came to the warehouse where the auction items were stored. There was a huge amount of gold and silver treasures piled up in the warehouse. All of these were paid in cash by the nobles who visited here. It will certainly secure tax revenue. All of these will be transferred to the city hall treasury, and the Baskerville family's financial power will become even more solid. I felt bad thinking about Hugo liking it, but since it wasn't that important right now, I decided to move on. Vikir searched the warehouse for a while. Bills and ledgers come out in piles. I decided to keep them as they would all be valuable evidence in the future sweep of the remnants of the party. But what Vikir was really aiming for was something else. Vikir pulled open the white cloth that was covering the corner of the warehouse. Then there. Hmm. Vikir sees something completely out of the ordinary, not what he was looking for. An iron cage, and a barbarian girl trapped inside it. The girl who had been running wild just a moment ago was crouching in the corner of the cage. Nung, grunt. A barbarian girl moaning as if she was in pain. Looking closely, there are clear signs of malnutrition and abuse all over the body. It felt like I had been whipped outside the cage. I guess he was corporally punished after biting off the merchant's fingers earlier. Bikir clicked his tongue for a moment. Soon, he took out a potion exclusive to the knights that he was wearing on his belt. Then he opened the cage door and sprinkled the potion on the girl's body. Cheekeek. With a loud sound, the wound heals and new skin grows. The girl, who was suffering, soon opened her eyes and was so surprised to see Vikir inside the cage that she hid in a corner. Vikir quietly looked at the barbarian girl. Hair color is a mixture of black and silver hair. Pointy ears. Charcoal soot smeared all over my face. 
When I look at my forearms and thighs, I see teeth and claw marks that I have seen many times before. Cerberus. Old memories came back. At the time of her practical exam at the age of eight, the Kier crossed the safety border and entered the waters of the Red and Black Mountains and encountered Cerberus, a monster ranked A-plus in danger level. At that time, I remembered that Cerberus' side was full of small wounds shaped like arrowheads. Hmm. Could it be that the barbarian tribe that hunted Cerberus back then? It was a pretty reasonable guess. Meanwhile, the barbarian girl seemed to have regained her energy as her wounds healed to a certain extent, and was crouching in the corner of the cage, glaring at Vakir. Vakir spoke briefly. Unintelligible sound. It means, go. When the barbarian girl heard those words, her eyes widened. Vakir shrugged his shoulders. I know how to use at least a basic barbarian language. This is because before returning, they fought countless times against the enemy and the barbarians of the Black Mountains. Unintelligible sound. When Vikir told her to run away, the barbarian girl only blinked her two big eyes. When Vikir left the bottle containing the remaining potion on the floor and went out of the cage, the barbarian girl also hesitantly came out of the cage. She stared at Vikir for a few seconds before tearing down the tent and running away. With the potion bottle that Vikir had placed on the floor. Unintelligible sound. At the last moment, the barbarian girl left behind something to say, but she spoke so fast that Vakir could not understand. Now then, let's find what we really want. Vakir turned his head and resumed his work. Gold and silver treasures, bills and ledgers, checks, antiques, works of art. But Vakir wanted something else. It was here. Eventually, Bakir removed the red cloth covering the innermost corner of the auction house. There, lying there, was a massive beast with large horns. Hell Buffalo, Murcielago. Risk Level, A. Size, 3M. Location of Discovery, Red and Black Mountains Part 2 Ridge. A type of cow that lives in the oil world deep in hell. It is said to have 19 hearts and will not stop charging until all of them stop. Buzz buzz buzz. Beelzebub on the wrist was whining that he was hungry. The sound of the pit bull knight's swords and the screams of the enemies coming from afar are getting closer and closer. I felt like I had to finish my meal quickly and go. Episode 38 Sponsor, 1. Club, burning suspension has closed. Could it be that they just closed the door? It burned down completely. Vikir burned down the entire large hotel building where the burning suspension was located. Grumble. A huge amount of firewood, a burning club burning suspension. This huge devil's cave, where the second and third generations of powerful families gathered to enjoy luxury and pleasure, was completely burned down in front of all citizens. Even though it was night, the city was as bright as day due to the light emitted from the burning suspension. A few idle young people were lingering in front of the club with a look of lingering regret. Why? Are you sad, you pigs? I had to run away from the stern looks of the pit bull knights lined up in front of the burning building. Bikir didn't just burn down the club. Among the vips who came in and out of this place, the seven sons of seven families who spent the most money and had the most extravagant entertainment were lined up in front of the burning club. With only the head left. The severed head showed signs of torture. Below, the evil deeds they had committed during their lifetime were reported in detail. Vikir announced the executive branch's position as soon as dawn the next day. He came directly to the square without a spokesperson. Before the law, one's status is meaningless. Everyone must follow the law. It was an indifferent tone, but its impact was enormous. Public opinion about Vikir was divided into either good or bad. Dislikes are almost impossible to find. Everyone in Underdog City praised Vikir as a great consul whenever three or more gathered together. Of course, each indigenous family that lost a child they had raised with great care did not remain silent. The Montblanc family, the Pierre family, the Louis family, the Channel family, the Ferragamo family, the Hermes family, and the Prada family each sent a protest to the magistrate. But Vikir's position was firm. Not only were they involved in all kinds of crimes, but they were also directly involved in the illegal slave trade, which was considered the most taboo in the imperial family. There can be no consequences other than death. 
the emperor of the empire treated the illegal slave trade as the worst crime. This is because most of the illegally traded slaves were barbarians from outside the empire. Of course, the emperor is not doing this because he is concerned about the human rights of barbarians outside the country who are not citizens of the empire. This is because they are wary of another war being waged to catch them, that is, private fraud. In order for local nobles to engage in privateering, they had to form private armies, which could lead to plotting rebellion. There is a risk that slave hunting, which was carried out secretly out of sight of the imperial family, could degenerate into a rebellion or coup. In fact, this was supported by the fact that the source of several large-scale rebellions a few years ago was an army organized to hunt slaves. So the emperor nominally said. It is inevitable that war will create slaves, but it is unacceptable to wage war to create slaves. From then on, the illegal slave trade was treated with the same weight as a first-degree felony and treason by the empire. Vikir spoke clearly. I obtained all the bills issued, ledgers recorded, and cash transactions made by the seven executed prisoners. These incidents are being formally investigated by the Baskervilles and will further be reported to the imperial family. In short, yes, if you refute it, you become a traitor. After this conversation, protests from the seven families ceased. Now was not the time to whine at Vakir because of his anger and sadness over losing his son. It looked like the family was going to be extinct right away, and there was no way they could afford to do that. In the end, an unprecedented situation occurred in which the heads of the seven noble families personally visited the magistrate's office, knelt down, and begged for their sins. He is in a position where he has to bow down to the person who killed his son and beg for the survival of his family. The cost of educating a child incorrectly is scary. They cried, banging their foreheads on the marble floor of Akir was merciless. I have already examined all the black ledgers in the burning suspension. Those guilty will soon be summoned and their treatment will be determined according to the crime. If I were to put the results into words, it would be enough to fill countless pages. However, to summarize only the key results are as follows. Paragraph 1. All property of the Mont Blanc family, the Pierre family, the Louis family, the Channel family, the Ferragamo family, the Hermes family, and the Prada family are confiscated and transferred to the national treasury. Originally, only property earned through illegal activities should be confiscated, but at present, it is virtually impossible to distinguish between legal and illegal property, so the entire amount is confiscated. Paragraph 2. Based on the evil beasts of the Mont Blanc family, the Pierre family, the Louis family, the Channel family, the Ferragamo family, the Hermes family, and the Prada family, three families are held for treason and destroyed. The reference point is based on the seven people executed on January 0. Paragraph 3. Among those belonging to the Mont Blanc family, the Pierre family, the Louis family, the Channel family, the Ferragamo family, the Hermes family, and the Prada family, those involved in this incident will be punished twice as much as the sentence under the special provisions of Noblesse Oblige. It does not overlap with the contents of paragraphs 1 and 2. Even shorter, if you summarize it in three lines, it can be shortened like this. Yours. All. Fucked. Since the new vice consul took office, there has been no more blood drying on the floor of the execution site for a while. The dirty blood of the pests that have been eating away at the city. The flower bed will become even more abundant. Vikir muttered as he looked at the flower bed at the entrance to the execution site and the flowers blooming there. The white lilies that the chihuahua took care of with great care had suddenly turned into red lilies. Well, anyway. The local government's conservative forces, who had been challenging the policy decisions of the magistrate on every matter, kept their mouths shut and hung their heads as if dead, and the local emirs who used to only fart were now trembling at the mere sight of the shadows of civil servants. The seven indigenous families who were at least worthy of playing a power game with Vikir were uprooted and virtually exterminated. Moreover, other cities were also concerned about the rumor that Vikir held some of the military power of the Baskervilles. Who in the world would not hold their breath in front of the military leader of the Baskervilles? There were no longer any beings that could get in Vikir's way during the underdog. No, on the contrary, people who would give wings to Vikir's steps were appearing one after another. In fact, the evil behavior of the seven indigenous families has gone beyond the limit. 
If you're going to criticize the new vice consul for being cruel, then criticize me first. If you soothe and soothe, new skin will come out. Rotten flesh must be cut out. It was truly deserved treatment. Clean wealthy people who were disadvantaged for being honest, or nobles who were dismissed or exiled for being too honest, declared their support for Vakir one after another. Although they had no power or wealth, they were people with great honor and trust who were referred to as intellectuals, teachers, mentors, etc. by ordinary citizens. Following them, a large number of Confucian intellectuals supported Vakir's bold reforms, and his approval rating increased day by day. Bakir used this incident as a watershed to reinterpret all past precedents and thus free all wronged prisoners and prisoners of conscience. As large-scale manpower was needed to uncover the truth about past events through these procedures, a large number of additional civil servants and related subcontractors began to be hired, and as a result, the unemployment rate in underdog cities also decreased significantly. The insufficient salary budget was covered by tax revenues that increased dramatically in the process of eradicating the illegal underground economy, so there was no particular noise. Because of this, citizens of Underdog City held large-scale mass demonstrations in front of City Hall every day. Permanent Term of Vice Consul Vakir We strongly urge you. May Vice Consul Vakir remain in this Underdog City forever. I love you Vakir. It was a protest I did because I really enjoyed it. The Chihuahua manager is smiling every day. The attitude of distrust and contempt that Bakir had displayed when he first took office had seemingly disappeared. Have you gone to work, assistant governor? I brought you coffee here. If you are an office manager, be faithful to your own work. There is no need to bring coffee or anything like that. This is a personal thank you. Didn't you save me from almost getting stabbed by a clown last time? Then a cup of coffee is too salty for a lifesaver. It's salty I put two sugars, two creams, and about this much water. The two have become quite close over that time, to the point where they even joke around like this. Vikir is currently teaching his chihuahua how to write. More precisely, how to imitate various fonts. With the writing he had learned in this way, Bakir was creating new laws and repairing previous laws. Ruby Mine Development Project with the Morgue, Stabilization of Prices of Agricultural and Livestock Products, Compensation for Those Who Contributed to the Territory, Exemption System for Slaves Who Contributed to the Territory, Equal Development of Underdeveloped Areas, and Compliance with Punishment in Case of Violation of the Law. Institutional guarantee of profits, increased taxes on merchants outside the territory, increased taxes on the wealthy, reduced taxes on poor farmers, elimination of superstitions, nationalization of land, etc. Bikir carefully selected those that were effective among the laws to be implemented in the future and refined those that fit the current social atmosphere. Naturally, the legislators were amazed at Bikir's extensive legal knowledge and bowed even more deeply. Underdog poetry was developing remarkably even at this moment. Are you really 15 years old? Bikurda chicly chose the off-field chihuahua's questions. Finally, Bikir began one of the most important tasks of the day. Office manager. Yes. The chihuahua quickly ran up and sat next to me. Bikir still gives work instructions in an indifferent tone. Is there any T.O. left in the dungeon now? Episode 39 Sponsor Two. It was a late night when the moon wasn't even up. Bakir visited the dungeon beneath the city hall. The almost empty prison was filled with the stench of something rotting. The prison itself is a creepy place, but seeing it immersed in darkness and empty makes it even more creepy. All the guards had left work early. Unusually, everyone was on guard without a single watch. All the prisoners have been executed, pardoned, or transferred so the area is now completely empty. Vikir headed to a prison in the deepest part of the place. The darkest and most foul-smelling place. Cell. Even in the dungeon, the door to the most remote area is the only one that is securely locked. And there was the only prisoner left alone in this dungeon. She was a female secretary who assisted Baron Gambino, a major player in the underground economy. A woman with short-cut greenish-blonde hair can be seen crouching in the corner of her cell, wearing a prison uniform and heavy handcuffs. Vikir pulled out a chair and sat in front of the bars. Grumble. The sound of iron chair legs scraping against the stone floor echoed loudly in the empty prison. 
the name Sen Rose Thindi Wendy. Am I right? She did not answer the Kier's question. All I do is lower my empty eyes and look at the floor. Why did you keep me alive? Thindi Wendy's question was empty. Freak show. And the pit bull nights. That night, when everything that moved died, Thindi Wendy gritted her teeth and ran away. I could never die like this. Even if you don't die, it's the end if your wrists and ankles are cut off. She had a job to do and she could never die or become a wreck in a place like this. Who among those dying was not like that, at least Thindi Wendy thought she was much more desperate and desperate than the others. But the fighting dog's teeth in front of her were cruel. A member of the Pitbull Order blocked Thindi Wendy's path, which was tantamount to a death sentence. The moment the red hot blade plunged into her neck, Thindi Wendy gritted her teeth. But. Tong. The sound made the moment the knife pierced the neck was a bit surprising. That's because the Pitbull Knight's knife could not pierce Thindi Wendy's neck. Vikir. A newly appointed deputy consul. He was holding up a bundle of chains to block the Pitbull Knight's sword. The Pitbull Knights seemed very surprised that Vikir had blocked his sword, but he bowed briefly at Vikir's next words. This woman is an exception. Don't hurt a single fingertip of her and capture her alive. Since then, Thindi Wendy has been imprisoned in the dungeon. Vikir looked at Thindi Wendy silently for a while. Finally, he asked. If you answer my questions truthfully, I will release you from here. That was something that made Thindi Wendy's ears perk up. But soon, Thindi Wendy lowered her head and muttered self-deprecatingly. From the moment I was already imprisoned here, I lost the will to escape. There is no reason to do that anymore. Either way, Bakir's questions have already begun. You are the reason why Baron Gambino, who was just an insignificant sodomite, was able to rapidly increase his power recently, right? After researching, I found that he was very good at making money. If that talent had blossomed somewhere other than the underworld, you would have become a good merchant or financier. Then Thindi Wendy laughed. What's the use of all that now? It was a mockery that seemed to ask. Bikir quietly looked into Thindi Wendy's eyes. And then he opened his mouth in a pleasant voice. I assure you. Answer my questions and I'll get you out of here. But. Bikir paused for a moment and tilted his head toward the bars to make eye contact with Thindi Wendy. A blazing red light pierced her green retina. If you don't answer, you will regret this day forever. The voice was filled with an unknown and strange power, making the listener feel a different kind of intimidation besides fear. Thindi Wendy opened her mouth without even knowing what she was feeling. If I can answer, I will. Good night. Bikir asked bluntly. What do you think? What do you mean? Do you think I'm doing a bad job of enforcing the law? Then Thindi Wendy answered in a calm tone. How important is the opinion of a petty criminal like me? I'm asking a petty criminal like you. Then I will bother to answer. I think you're doing it wrong. At those words, Bakir nodded. The reason is? In all royal studies, the factor that is cited as the core virtue of a great consul is virtue. A strong rule of law may be effective to some extent in the beginning, but in the long run, I'm not sure. It's virtue. What is that? Do not get on the cart even if you are tired, do not put a cover on the cart even if it is hot, and do not line up armed soldiers when marching. It is thanks to him that when a politician dies, all the citizens shed tears, even children refrain from singing, and even those who pound the mill do not hum. Is it a big flaw that I am not virtuous? If it's a big flaw, it's a big flaw. Because of that, you won't live long. By striking down cheap villains with harsh laws, Ilsen's dignity has been established, but in the future, he will kill and injure many common people, which will only build up resentment and anger in the long run. Do you think I am afraid of the resentment and anger of the common people? Even if that were the case for the common people, the Baskervilles would not be very happy either. Although it is limited to Underdog City, the citizens will be more afraid of you as vice consul than the head of the Baskervilles. Hmm. That is true. It will be the same even if your boss takes over or your successor takes over. The purpose of changing the law is to assert your own authority and hastily achieve achievements, 
but many indigenous forces will be gnashing their teeth because of this. There are many underworld gangs in other cities as well. Considering their public sentiment, I don't think you will live long. So what do you think I should do next? You are now in a precarious situation like do. If you want to live in my name even now, resign from your position as vice consul, return all authority to the Baskervilles, and dedicate the credit to the family and the imperial family. Then, go to a place appropriate for your age, such as Yaji in the Red and Black Mountains or the Academy in the center of the empire and make plans for your future. And again. Hide your power and cultivate your studies as unobtrusively as possible from others. Also, suggest to your superiors that they seek out and hire talented people who have not been revealed to the world, respect the elderly, take care of orphans, praise those who have not been recognized for their merits, and respect those who are virtuous. Then what do I gain? For now, you will feel at ease. And by then, the Baskerville matriarch will have received all the criticism she deserves. Even if the ball is taken away from you right away, you are still only fifteen years old. Even if it's just a facade, aren't you old enough to have a reputation that extends all the way to the imperial capital? In response to Thindiwendi's long advice, Vicar smiled brightly, which was rare. Her advice was quite consistent with Vikir's future plans. Good night. Vikir nodded. At the same time. Crash. The iron door opened. Vikir ripped off the lock with just his grip strength and then released all of Thindiwendi's restraints. As promised, you are now free. Thindi Wendy raised her head and looked at the iron gate in front of her. Then he quietly turned his eyes and looked at Vikir. Are you really letting me go? Yes. I keep my promises. You will regret it, right? A little bit of life returned to Thindi Wendy's eyes. Vikir saw that and smiled. I hope so. Thindi Wendy tilts her head. Eventually, Bakir opened his mouth. Since you have said good things to me, I will also say good things to you. Thindi Wendy stopped before leaving the prison. With his back to her, Bakir opened his mouth. There were seven famous native families in Underdog City. The Montblanc family, the Pierre family, the Lewis family, the Channel family, the Ferragamo family, the Hermes family, and the Prada family were all exterminated this time. But just a few years ago, their number was eight, not seven. Bikir did not miss the slight trembling of Thindiwendi's body at those words. Originally, there was an eighth family called the Mezzanidnero family. It was the wealthiest merchant family among them. But they were exterminated overnight. All of the family members died tragically. Do you know what the reason is? The reason was that the Baskerville family's swordsmanship book was stolen. One day, the family's eight-year-old son said he had learned good swordsmanship and was happy about it. The head of the Messinidnero family held a large reception for his son's birthday party and then asked him to demonstrate the newly learned swordsmanship. Stop. Thindi Wendy raised her hand to stop Vikir. But Vikir paid no heed and continued speaking. With everyone gathered, my son's swordsmanship demonstration continued. But everyone gathered there was very surprised. What my son showed me was the Baskerville-style swordsmanship that is secretly shared only among the Baskervilles. Stop. Immediately, a tip went to the Baskervilles. The Baskervilles place great value on their family's swordsmanship. The head of the Baskerville family, who judged that top military secrets had been leaked, unleashed the hunting dogs, and from that day on, the Messinidnero family disappeared from the world. Stop it, you bastard. Thindi Wendy screamed sharply. But Vikir did not stop. But it turns out that the Messinidnero family was not guilty. The people who offered to give his son a good swordsmanship were children from seven different families. They tricked a young boy from the Baskerville family into taking a swordsmanship book and taught it to a child from the Messinidnero family. And the immature child demonstrated it in front of a gathering of adults. It was by design. I'm telling you to stop. Please. But there was one survivor of the Messinidnero family, who were all said to have been wiped out. She was a young girl, one year older than her, and the seven bastards secretly took this girl of the same age away from the tragedy of massacre. Ugh. Ugh. Thindi Wendy stumbled and soon leaned her back against the wall. Her eyes were bright red and bloodshot. 
Bikir continued. That girl had to suffer all kinds of cruel, base, and shameful torture because she was bright and beautiful. The contents of that torture, it's hard for me to even put it into words. I don't want to listen any more. Thanks for your effort. Bloody tears flow from one of Thindy Wendy's eyes. She turned away from the wall and staggered outside. At that time. I told you. If you don't listen, you will regret today for the rest of your life. Bikir stood still and spoke without moving. There is a sequel to this story. At those words, Thindy Wendy's step stopped. Bikir shrugged his shoulders. And quite a bit of time passed, and a new vice consul was appointed to the city. The vice consul uncovered all the old evils within the city, brought them out, and punished them severely. And the trigger of the incident was the seven bastards who drove the Messinid Nero family into ruin. Thindi Wendy turned her head and looked at Vikir. Vikir looked straight at Thindi Wendy and opened his mouth. The new vice consul tortured those seven bastards severely. The torture was so terrible that a torture technician who had worked at the castle for thirty years vomited up what he had just eaten the day before. And as they were dying, these seven bastards confessed all their sins. Among them were some about the Messinid Nero family. They admitted all their sins and apologized. Then Thindi Wendy screamed sharply. Apologies. How dare you apologize to someone? The only survivor of the Messinid Nero family. To that girl. She is now going by the pseudonym Tsin Rose Cindy Wendy, and the girl whose real name is Messina de Nero Cindy Wendy. After hearing those words, Thindi Wendy stumbled with a dazed expression. Wow! She vomited out what was inside. My vision is spinning round and round. The darkness of a dungeon where you can't even see an inch ahead. The rotten stench that had been lingering in the cell from a while ago seemed to be getting worse. Thindi Wendy placed her hand on the wall and her forehead with her other hand. She asked, spitting on the floor. How can I believe you? How can I believe you when you say that you captured them, tortured them, investigated the truth, and even received an apology? Thindi Wendy screams as if struggling. There was no answer from Bakir. But. Grumble. Bakir simply lit the torch by lighting the stick he was holding in his hand. Soon, the inside of the cell in the dungeon became brightly lit. And that moment. Thindi Wendy's eyes widened as if torn apart. Seven headless bodies are kneeling in the corner of the room. All of the corpses had their fingers worn away, and the blood flowing from their fingers was plastered all over the floor, walls, and ceiling. The entire room was stained red with blood. And when I looked closely, the red color on the floor, ceiling, and walls seemed to have been completely painted over, with countless letters over and over again. Please forgive my mistake. I would rather die, so I ask you to please not touch my family. We are the ones who exterminated the Messinad Nero family. Please forgive us for our sins. We sincerely apologize to Thindi Wendy. We have committed a sin. I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. Save me, save me, save me, save me, save me. I don't want to die, I don't want to die. I'm scared, I'm scared. A corpse giving off a rotten smell. And when they were alive, they wrote apologies written on the floor to the point where all ten fingers were worn away. The bloody letters that made up the apology were enough to stain the entire room red. Thindi Wendy was standing in the middle of this red room, looking at Bakir with a new expression. Soon, Bakir walked in front of her. But the Messinid Nero family's revenge is not over. There is still one family left. Bakir's meaning was clear. This means that the greatest enemy, the Baskerville family, remains. Vikir said. Blame Baskerville. You deserve it. And that aside, I speak for all Baskervilles. Yet. Vikir's waist slowly bent in front of Thindi Wendy. Sorry. And at the same time. Knock knock patter. Tears flowed from Thindi Wendy's eyes and began to fall on the stone floor. The two looked at each other motionlessly in that position for a while. Finally, Thindi Wendy spoke. You are also a Baskerville, why are you helping me? Vikir made no reply to this. And Thindi Wendy, who was quick-witted, understood the meaning of the silence. 
Hating and hating the Baskervilles are both inside and outside, but they are the same. In that respect, Vikir and Thindi Wendy understood each other well. Yet. Thindi Wendy went outside the prison. And towards Vikir, who was still in prison, he spoke in a calm voice, unlike before. No matter what you do in life, I will make sure you never run out of money. It was the moment when Vikir gained a reliable sponsor. Episode 40, Morgs United Front, 1. The morning dawned. Yesternight. After working overtime, Bakir slept in his residence across from the city magistrate's office. The Chihuahua, who knew this fact, went there early in the morning. Sleeper Consul. The morning sun has already risen. Now it's time to go to work Ugh Hai. After knocking on the door of the official residence, the Chihuahua who went inside could not finish saying good morning and let out a strange scream. The entire room of the official residence was covered in blood. Blood, 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 soaking the white bedspread and staining the grooves between the marble tiles on the floor red in a grid pattern. The walls, ceiling, and bed were all drenched in blood. Ah. Good morning, manager. Bakir gets up from the bed so calmly. Looking at his sleepy expression, it looks like he was really sleeping just a moment ago. And on the bed beneath him was a corpse with its head and torso separated. This man wearing a black mask had a dagger in his hand, and anyone could see that he was an assassin. Vikir said as he looked at the assassin's body lying on the floor. Hmm. I don't remember. It looks like they killed him while he was talking in his sleep. Is it true? No way. It's a light joke. Wouldn't it be this playful if you were fifteen? Bakir thought she was making a joke of her own, but the Chihuahua didn't seem to know it was a joke in the first place. Assistant Consul, what kind of childhood did you have while you were still at home? Wasn't it very fun? No, it's not a matter of fun. The Chihuahua seemed at a loss for words in many ways. Bakir shook his head. These days, a lot of these flies are getting stuck. Two poisoned arrows, four poisoned drinks, six random street attacks, stabbings, throwing sulfuric acid, sniping, arson, hitting with a carriage, etc. This all happened in the last three days. This was the first assassin to enter the bedroom, but he was no match for Vikir. This is because each warrior who went through the era of destruction had mastered a technique that allowed them to sense the murderous intent of those around them while they were sleeping, and the same was true for Vikir. Hmm. Well, you should think positively. Doesn't that mean I'm receiving a lot of attention? You really have the guts. You're being rude to your superiors, manager. Vikir responds indifferently and puts on his outerwear. The chihuahua was sticking out its tongue as it calmly followed Vikir out of the bedroom. Looking at you, assistant consul, I can't believe you're really fifteen years old. Where would the blood go? No matter how much of a Baskerville bloodline you are no, the other Baskervilles weren't like this in the first place, were they? The consul who was there before. The Chihuahua continued to babble, but Vikir was already paying attention to what he was saying. Instead, what he was thinking about was the harvest he had gained the last time he robbed an illegal auction house. Beelzebub, the binge-eating fly slash all. Minus one slot, burn, Cerberus, A+. Plus. Minus two slot, tough life, hell buffalo, A. Minus 3 slot, bleeding, hellhound, B+. Plus. Demon sword Beelzebub. This strange magic sword, which steals and absorbs the abilities of those it kills, contains the power of the demonic beast, Hell Buffalo Murcielago, that I met at the auction house not long ago. The troll's ability, high speed regeneration, which had a danger rating of C+, plus, disappeared and the Hell Buffalo's tough life took its place. Ultra fast regeneration, is the ability to quickly heal an injured body, but, tough life, is the ability to make the body tough and hard enough to prevent injury in the first place, so this is much more versatile. In the first place, the Hell Buffalo was a high-ranking monster that could not even be compared to trolls, so it was natural that its effect was superior. I never thought there would be a corpse of a class A monster at the auction house. You were lucky. Thanks to eating it, I was able to easily defeat the assassin who came yesterday. The skills of the assassin who infiltrated the official residence last night were at the level of a graduate. Although I was only a junior who had just joined the ranks of graduates, I remember how he created an aura that was as sticky as liquid. 
because I was attacked unknowingly, I was slightly stabbed in the chest with a dagger. However, thanks to the synergy effect between the protection of the river Styx and the tough life of the Hell Buffalo, only one light wound appeared on Bakir's body. The assassin himself probably didn't know. W. What kind of body is this hard? Who knew this would be his last will? We must find out who is behind the assassins and stop them. You are right. In fact, although he did not tell Chihuahua, Bakir was thinking of resigning from his position as deputy consul after completing this work. Just like Thindi Wendy's advice I heard a while ago. Right then. There was something that could help Bakir with his plans. A call came from the Baskerville headquarters. A huge black carriage stood in front of City Hall. A luxury carriage with the tooth-shaped logo, the symbol of the Baskerville family. The person who visited the City Hall early in the morning was someone Vakir knew well. Deacon John Barrymore. He personally came to Vakir. Young master. Long time no see. I see, butler. Her face has improved. Deacon Barrymore smiled brightly after hearing Vakir's answer. Look at that. Didn't I tell you when you were leaving your home? I believe you will do well. Rumors from outside are reaching the family home. They were all about the Ming vice consul of Underdog City. I was lucky in many ways. The timing was right. However, the protagonist of the rumor still maintains a dry humility. Soon, Deacon Barrymore revealed the reason for coming here. The head of the family is looking for you. You probably want an accurate report on this incident. If it were a report, it would have already been submitted in writing, right? Huh, is that the same as having your son come and tell you in person? After speaking, Barrymore stroked his mustache and narrowed his eyes. You have high expectations. It's the first time I've seen the matriarch smile like that. Hugo Les Baskerville. He was still sitting in front of his desk with an expressionless face. However, Bikir felt an alien energy emanating from him. That's right. Good job, son. It was an unusually warm atmosphere. Hugo put down today's morning newspaper in front of his desk. The number one person most loved by the citizens of Underdog City, Bakir. The most trusted person by merchants in Underdog City, Bakir. The most beloved person among the farmers of Underdog City, Bakir. The number one person most respected by the children of Underdog City, Bakir. The person most supported by intellectuals in Underdog City is Bakir. The number one person the assassins in Underdog City want to kill the most, Bakir. The results of a popular vote among citizens were published on the front page of the newspaper. You have made a great contribution. I just did what I had to do. There are too many idiots in the world who can't do what they should do. Hugo looked at Bakir with a faint smile on his lips. Illegal slave trading is a serious crime punishable by death for both the buyer and seller. Thanks to your performance, you received a commendation from the imperial family. It is an honor. This opportunity allowed us to wash away the image that Baskervilles are only good at using swords and have bad minds. You did a great job. The special law introduced by Vakir, the performance in the process of promulgating it, and the strong enforcement of the law set an example not only to all the cities governed by the Baskervilles, but even to the imperial family. Bakir repaid Hugo's unconventional personnel appointment with unprecedented results. Among the family customs of the Baskervilles is sure of rewards and punishments. If you do well, you are rewarded, if you do poorly, you are punished. Bakir had achieved outstanding results and should have been rewarded accordingly. And today, Hugo had called Bakir home to discuss the reward. Enter the Academy. The Imperial Academy, Colossio, the very place where all the world's elite dream of entering. Bakir asked after hearing that. Isn't it normal to enter the academy at the age of twenty? As long as you have the skills, there is no big limit to age. Both early enrollees and late study students can enroll. You just need to not exceed the conditions of be under twenty-five years old when you enroll and under thirty years old when you graduate. I will live up to your expectations. Bakir expressed his opinion with a short nod. But? Hugo, who would normally have ended the conversation at this point, showed a rare willingness to continue the conversation further. I'm planning to send a few people, including you, to the academy, 
but I haven't made the entries yet. Do you have a close brother who would like to go with you? It was a completely unexpected question. Isn't this something a father would ask his son? Oops. It's really my father. Bikir soon remembered a fact he had forgotten. Bastard. In any case, Bikir is also Hugo's son. Maybe it was because he wasn't treated like a son for so long that he had forgotten about it. Bikir opened his mouth after pondering for a bit. I am best friends with the high bro, middle bro, and low bro triplets. Is there anything special about being best friends? If you want to keep someone by your side and tease them, that's what you're friends with. Is that so? Hugo's eyes widened slightly as if he was surprised, but he soon nodded in understanding. Please note. And so the conversation about the academy case ended. The moment when Vakir was about to leave the door after finishing his prayers. Oh. Son, please wait a moment. When Vakir stopped and turned around, Hugo stood up for a moment. Finally, he spoke in a low voice. I looked at the laws of Underdog City that you have established. It is an immature result. There were quite a few amendments to the agricultural law. It was very efficiently and well maintained. That is an overstatement. Bikir had reorganized the legal system for large scale farms on the outskirts of Underdog City, in the area bordering the lower reaches of the Red and Black Mountains and the wide open plains. In addition to the ruby mines, there are many rice fields where sugar cane, tobacco, cotton, etc., are grown. The reality was that mainly barbarian prisoners were working there. Is that why? The barbarians who occasionally crossed the border to raid often targeted farms on the outskirts of Underdog City. Hugo said. How about taking a quick tour of the territory before enrolling in the academy? You should also see whether the laws you have developed are being followed. It will be a good experience. I will follow your orders. Vikir still prostrates without much disagreement. At that time. Hugo, who was looking at this with satisfaction, suddenly asked. But. Are you planning to go alone? Vikir tilted his head. So, are you going to tour the territory alone? When Vikir looked at Hugo with a curious expression, he sat down again in his chair and spoke in a relaxed voice. This territory inspection is a joint operation. At Hugo's words, Bakir closed his mouth and remained silent. He was expressing that he needed a little more explanation. Hugo, who understood this, brought out the real point. Do you remember the plan you set up when you were eight years old? The reason is during the ruby mine. Of course. I remember that the main content was to lease the ruby mining area to Morg and drive the barbarians there to keep the two forces in check without doing anything. Also known as car road murder. In order to expand the border, they would have to encounter barbarians anyway, so they planned to use the hand of Morg to eliminate them if possible. Hugo had a hearty smile on his lips. The plan worked. When you say it worked. The Morg made a proposal first. In a very low-key manner. It's been a while since Hugo looked this happy. He opened his mouth towards Bakir. I wonder what a joint subjugation war would be like. Episode 41, Morgs United Front, 2. Go. I will take care of the administrative work well. Vikir left Underdog City's city hall with a Chihuahua salute. As Vikir left for the outskirts of the territory, driving a black horse, another black horse followed behind him. See you again, master. He was Lord Baskerville, Staffordshire, a knight of the Order of Pitbulls. He had previously been in charge of Vikir's training, and was also by Vakir's side when he was suppressing an illegal slave auction house. How is Uncle Boston Terrier? Yes, the count is still the same. Ever since the subjugation of the slave auction house that day, he has been saying that Master Vakir should be brought to the Pitbull Knights. He also asked me to believe in him. What? Don't let the Wolfhound Knights steal you away. Never. Never. After speaking, Staffordshire grinned. Vikir also nodded without much response. The two headed to Red Fong Mountain on the outskirts of the territory, leading the attendants, supplies, and other party members that followed behind them. Red All Mountain, as its name suggests, is a red mountain rising steeply and sharply. And underneath, there was a wide, 
flat basin that made the mountain's sharpness stand out even more. It is near the stem leading to a huge tributary of the Red and Black Mountains, and the river has a lot of sediment and the land is fertile, so farming is quite good. Crops such as sugar cane, cotton, and tobacco were grown, and these were the main specialties of the Baskerville estate. And as you advance across this vast farmland, you will see straight aligned with reddish mineral veins ahead. Red light is shining here and there in the cross sections of the stratum that were cut off due to the earthquake. This is the ruby vein. There, people from the house of Morgue were digging for rubies. Simple forts made of wood and stone were seen rising high here and there. From now on, the Baskervilles also had to be on guard, as this was an area leased to people by the Morgue. Vikir looked at the farmland behind and the mining area ahead with sharp eyes. There was no sign of any particularly illegal activity. A daily scene of slaves tending and harvesting crops or digging the ground with a pickaxe. Perhaps because Morg was conscious of the Baskerville's delegation, he did not violate the treaty in any particular way. Staffordshire explained quietly to Vakir. This mission is nominally to inspect territory and promote goodwill. No. It is an advanced search party for the subjugation of barbarians behind the mountains. Otherwise, would there be any reason for the Knights of the Baskervilles to follow like this? The Baskerville family's armed group entered the territory of the House of Morgue disguised as an ordinary estate inspection team. Of course, Morgue also knew this. For some time now, the armed forces of the Morgue have also been gathering here, disguised as miners. Now Morgue and Baskerville will join forces to subdue the barbarians. The barbarians who do not know that a large number of swordsmen and wizards belonging to both families have gathered here will come here as usual and plunder the crops and slaves, and when that happens, the conspiracy begins. Staffordshire said. From what I heard, one delegate and twelve members of the House of Representatives from the Morgue's famous party, and one delegate and nineteen members of the House of Representatives from the Dark Party came. And the spirit of other magicians who are not members of the council seems to be strong as well. You risked your life and death in the morgue. While the morgue was putting forth so much effort, the Baskervilles only brought at most a few dozen knights, including Vakir, a member of the House of Representatives. However, the real elites of the Baskervilles were not here but in ambush on the other side of the mountain range, and this was also an agreement reached with the morgue, so it didn't really matter. Vakir had really come here to inspect the territory and promote friendship. Well, as Hugo said, it would be good if we could search the ecology of the barbarians at the same time. Soon, the people of the Baskerville family began to cross the mining area. Overmined coal mines were visible here and there, and wooden fences, simple forts, and watchtowers stood tall. Right then. Hmm. Vikir noticed something and slowed down his horse. A burning smell passes through my nose. The smell that comes when meat that has been grilled to its limit misses the time to be eaten and turns charred. Sure enough, the horses are scared and hesitate. I saw something standing vertically on the ground in front of me. It was long and pointed, rising vertically from the ground and reaching towards the sky. And there is something stuck in the middle. Vikir kicked the faltering horse's waist and moved forward. Eventually, the identity of the strange sculptures comes into view. It was a huge skewer made of iron. An iron skewer made by gathering the trace amounts of iron contained in the soil. There is only one being who can create something like this. You're a wizard. Since we entered the territory of Morg, famous for its magic clan, it was natural to see something like this. However, the things pierced by the skewers and nailed in the air were quite foreign. Skull. And the charred flesh. All the corpses that had been skewered to death were burned. The corpses of all types, both monsters and humans, were mixed and strung together, and some of them had been completely burned down to the bones, leaving only empty skewers. Y-N-G. Every time the wind blows, the skewered corpses turn into black powder and crumble. Slurp. A lump of charcoal, unknown whether it belonged to a barbarian or a monster, fell from the skewer and scattered as ashes on the floor. This is a harsh warning. Staffordshire said, looking up at all the skewered and burned things. This is most likely a warning to monsters and barbarians in Morgue. And Vikir already knew one person who gave this warning. Now that I think about it, he must have grown a lot. 
when Vikir was internally recalling memories of the past. Who is there? Stand down. Reveal your identity. Fierce shouts were heard from the watchtower in front. When Vikir looks up, he sees three women coming down from the top of the watchtower. Young women lightly walking down the air, treading like stairs. Red hair that burns like fire, and a dress that doesn't match the bloody fortress. Vikir already knew their identities due to his knowledge before returning. Morgs Hysis, Middlesis, and Losis Triplets. My wife and children are sixteen years old this year. Each of them is a master of water, grass, and earth magic, and when the three come together, the synergy effect is incredible. They were born at the same time on the same day and were called the Three Flowers of the Morgue. However, the names they were called in the public were slightly different. Three Fires. It means three disasters. It is said that each and every one of them has a crazy personality, and when they all gather together, their excitement reaches the sky. Beyond their high pride, they were so arrogant that they became infamous even among the Baskervilles. It is only natural that they are the main culprits who ruin the atmosphere of friendly competition at annual events every year. Moreover, their strong magic skills that covered up their damn personalities made them even more crazy. The three sisters of Morg are now here, guarding the fortress that is the gateway to Morg's domain. Vikir stepped forward and opened his mouth. We are ambassadors of the Baskervilles. Then Hysis, who was in front, laughed. So. That's why. I came to inspect the territory and have friendly exchanges. Open the fortress gate. Not now. I have reported it to the person in charge, so please wait. The saying is to wait, but there is no promise. Vikir asked. How long should I wait? Well. Won't the order come down by tomorrow? Ho 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 dash. It was unreasonable, no, it was more than unreasonable, it was close to a fight. Vikir's eyes narrowed. They say the Baskervilles are entering the Baskervilles land, but on what pretext are you stopping them? For a tenant, you're arrogant. Oh. Are you ignoring me as a tenant now? Don't you know the tenant protection law? That's the law you made, right? Don't you know your family's laws? I have already revised that law. So that the real tenants can be kicked out. While Hysis was speechless for a moment, Bakir drove the horse a little further forward. I am the vice consul of Underdog City. I made an appointment in advance, and this is the last time we will talk. Open the door. After hearing Bakir's words, the three sisters of the House of Morgue exchanged glances for a moment. Soon, the eldest, Hysis, grinned. I heard that a young idiot has been appointed to Underdog City. Oh my but what should I do about this? As young idiots, we've been through a lot of things. The three sisters raised their mana onto their palms. Yet. Quack quack quack. Water, grass, and earth magic unfolded and fell in front of the people of Baskerville Street. Vikir frowned slightly and spoke back. The laughter of the three sisters was loud beyond the rising mushroom clouds. Giggles, if you want to wait, wait. How dare you ignorant swordsman! No matter how much you call Baskerville, you can't just enter the land of Morg. Would you like to see how powerful the Baskerville supernova is? Then Staffordshire came up next to Vikir and said. I don't think I should say it in words. Vikir was also thinking the same thing. Right then. You bitches who don't even know the subject, how dare you make a fool of yourself in front of anyone. What a mess. What a mess. Three cries also came from the Baskerville delegation. Soon, three familiar faces came running out, kicking up the dust. High bro, middle bro, low bro. The Baskerville family's triplet brothers, who were at the rear of the delegation, stepped forward. These guys, who have become good friends again, stand side by side and glare at the three sisters of the morgue who are coming down in front of them. They snorted. You don't know the topic. So you're saying you're higher level than us? How dare people who don't even know fractions? But the three brothers denied what they said. Not us. Not. Not. Then who? 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 In response to the three sisters' question, the three brothers turned their heads in unison. 
this is the sign of our Baskervilles. The direction the three brothers looked at with eyes filled with respect and fear. This was the direction where Vakir was standing. Episode 42, Morgs United Front, 3. Vakir thought. What kind of situation is this? For the first time since returning, something unexpected happened. The three infamous young Baskervilles, who would in the future be called, Hugo's Trident, began to act friendly towards Vakir. Even before returning, Bakir crossed the line of fire several times due to being attacked by these triplets, and it was these guys' fault that he was captured and executed at the last moment. But what about now? The three brothers, High Bro, Middle Bro, and Low Bro, stood around Bakir. In the past, they surrounded it like this to harass them, but this time they surrounded it to protect them. This guy is the sign of our march, so can we let him fight with anyone? You have to keep your weight. I have to protect it. I have to protect it. Lobro even turned his head and winked at Vakir. For Vakir, this was even more absurd. Did you just cut off your finger and then wander away? However, this was not the first time Vakir had experienced this type of behavior from the triplets. Sure, they've become noticeably more compliant since they hunted the troll in front of everyone the other day. Maybe it was before that. Was it from when I caught Cerberus during my first practical evaluation at the age of eight? From the moment he approached Vakir, who was eating haggis, and started acting friendly, something seemed a little strange. Vakir had been living a life completely uninteresting to the brothers around him. This is because they were too weak and young to even be worth dealing with. However, such an indifferent attitude seems to have caused a mutation in the minds of these triplets. In the end, it was the Baskerville's habit to follow the philosophy of strong self-respect. Moreover, these guys seem to be under some strange illusion. Leave this to us, Bakir. I will repay you for recommending us to the academy. Leave it to me, Bakir. I will repay you. Leave it to me, Bakir. I will repay you. The triplets speak with a determined attitude. Only then was Vakir able to recall the conversation with Hugo not long ago. When asked who I was close to, I mentioned these triplets without much thought, and I guess that really impressed them. Vakir decided to just keep quiet. A child who thinks he or she is doing something great is bound to look cute. Furthermore, these triplets have very similar personalities, so at least they look cute. Vakir thought for a moment. It might be useful. These triplets will surely grow up to be very useful murder weapons in the future. Even though they are not very intelligent and cannot make their own decisions and move, they definitely did one thing they were told to do. He has been mobilized many times for all kinds of secret and unpleasant work, so his skills and loyalty have all been proven. Literally a hunting dog. Strictly obeys only the master's orders. And Vakir, who had been bitten by their teeth before, knew best. In the end, Vakir pretended not to win. I'll give it a try, brothers. Then the triplets' expressions brightened. The guys appeared in front of Vakir looking much happier than when they received Hugo's praise at the end of month evaluation. Okay, well, there's no reason to stop you if you do it that way. Vakir decided to stay back for a while. Yet. The three sisters of the House of Morg and the three brothers of the Baskervilles began to clash. They had already met at several annual events and were famous for having a very bad relationship. Soon, the three sisters attacked first. They seem like a bunch of idiots who all they know how to do is get together as a group. Rusus first put both hands on the ground. Her specialty was powerful water magic, so she created countless water droplets and began sending them out. Puff puff puff. The force of the water droplets flying at high speed was powerful. It is said that falling water accumulates over a long period of time and pierces the rock, but the mana-laden water droplets fired by Rusus were enough to pierce the rock in an instant. A land completely devastated. The water droplets sent by Rusus create countless holes in the ground and moisten the soil at the same time. Middle Sis followed suit. She specializes in powerful earth magic, and waves her hands together to gather the mushy dirt. Coo 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 coo. The soil, which was wet and easily deformed, became an earthen wall under mid orders and surrounded the three sisters. Moreover, sharp rocks protruded like blades from the outer surface of the earthen wall, 
making defense and attack possible at the same time. Lastly, the eldest sister, Hysis, came forward. Her specialty was powerful grass magic, so she waved her hands and pulled up the grass seeds from beneath the ground. Thick plant stems grew and spread out vines, growing in size based on the water of Low Sis and the soil of Middle Sis. The land, water, and plants worked in synergy with each other to strengthen Morg's fortress and at the same time put pressure on the enemies. Indeed, these qualities are so great that they are called the Three Flowers of the Morg. But the three Baskerville brothers were no slouch either. He he he, what are you going to do with the grass instead of meat? What should I do? What should I do? Hybro was the first to run out. The light aura of the gaseous form drew a sharp tooth and struck the earthen wall in front of it. Okay. Puff. Wow. The earthen wall splits apart, revealing the inside. Because it was only a one-circle spell, the limits of its defense power were clear. And after that, the blades of middle brow and low brow flew out and got stuck. The aura, rotating at high speed, vaporized the flying water droplets and tore the plant stems into pieces. Quack. Bang. Puff. Swords and magic clash fiercely. Magic raised more and more mana to reproduce the power of the elements more strongly, and swordsmanship used the mana and vitality within the body to explode. Which is stronger, magic or sword? It was a dispute that always broke out between Morg and Baskerville, whose fiefdoms were adjacent to each other. And today, these three sisters and three brothers stand at the forefront of that debate. These six people were fighting with all their might to prove their family's standard. For Vakir, who was watching this, it was just boring. After all, what kind of tension would there be in a fight between three class 1 wizards who only know how to use first circle magic and three lower ranking sword experts who have just mastered Baskerville type 1? Moreover, Bakir has no particular attachment or brotherly love to the Baskerville family, so it is even more of a wasteland across the river. I just wish they were all dead. It was an extremely cynical attitude. However, except for Bakir, the other knights of the Baskerville family had a slightly different attitude. Even if no one says it, it looks quite exciting. Staffordshire asked Bakir, who had a sour expression on his face. Isn't it fun? What? Isn't this a place where young dreamers who will lead the family in the future compete for talent and potential? If you think about it that way, I'm a dreamer too. Master, you are already, you're not at the level to play at that age. It's just a waste of time. I need to pass by quickly. There are a lot of things to discuss when meeting the person in charge of the fortress. But Vikir could not finish his sentence. Kwa 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 kwa. This is because a powerful explosion occurred and swept away a wide area. Aya. Ugh. The three sisters of the House of Morg and the three brothers of the Baskervilles were all shocked. The fire burning everything around sticks out its red tongue. Steel skewers rising from the ground turned the surrounding area into a field of thorns. Puff. Wow. An earthen wall pierced by a skewer collapses instantly. The hot wind burned all the water and plants, and even pushed the blades of the Baskerville triplets away. The border between fire and iron, red and black, instantly separates the house of Morg and the house of Baskerville. A magic so powerful that even the other Baskervilles, who were happily watching the children's fight, were startled and pulled out their swords halfway. Crackle. Crack. Pop. Grumble. In the blink of an eye, the surrounding cotton fields turned into an inferno. The Baskerville's triplets barely managed to escape beyond the wall of fire. However, the hair was already black and bubbly. What is this? You almost burned to death. What? What? The triplets raised their heads in protest against the morgue's excessive suppression. However, the three sisters of the morgue on the other side were treated even worse. Not only were they scorched by the flames, but their entire bodies were scratched and torn by skewers. There was a deep sense of fear in the eyes of Hysis, Middlesis, and Losis crawling on the floor. Ha, ha, I almost died just now. If I had avoided it just a little later, I would have died, ha dash. Sisters, I'm scared dash. The Baskerville triplets, who saw them shaking, closed their mouths that were about to protest. 
in the hands of Morg, who is merciless even to members of the same family. Everyone turned their heads towards the direction from which the fire magic came. Soon, a calm voice was heard from beyond the wall of fire. What are they doing? A cold voice, but somehow youthful. Eventually, an executioner with an iron skewer and hot flames appears. The nickname he will be given in the future is, Wu Hu of Zetian. The heroine of Morg who will be called, of fire and skewers, or, queen of red and black. But you're still young. Vikir raised his head. An eight-year-old girl with blurry memories. And now, the fifteen-year-old girl has grown up. More Camus. When I met her again after seven years, she was looking down at me. Episode 43 Fiancé, 1. The Morgue Supernova. The only daughter of the head of the family, Morgue Lespinay. Pedigree is lineage, talent is talent, personality is personality, and appearance is appearance. No one is missing anything, and no one doubts that she will become the head of the Morgue family in the future. But he's still a fifteen-year-old kid. Vikir raised his head and looked beyond the wall of fire and the dead pool created by the skewers. More Camus. There she was, standing in her arrogant posture and looking down at her. And Morg's three sisters, who are sprawled all over the floor, are trembling as they see Camus like that. Hey, Camus, you sisters. Ugh, just trying to stop intruders. Well, they started the fight first. High sis, middle sis, and low sis are one year older than Camus. However, they were crushed by Camus' overwhelming spirit and were unable to breathe properly, with their heads down on the ground. It was an unusual sight for Morg, a renowned wizard, who had a strict hierarchy among siblings as there was a large difference in achievement depending on age. Yet. Camus had an alluring smile. Camus. Are you talking to me now, sisters? Hi. Oh no. Is that not possible, Master Vice President? Move. If you don't want to be like that. Camus stretches out his finger as if he is annoyed. There, burned corpses impaled on iron skewers were lined up along the border line. This was the part where it became clear who created this brutal landscape. Aya. The three sisters trembled and ran away at the words of their one year younger brother. There is only strange silence on the battlefield where they disappeared. Even the Baskerville triplets, who were showing their teeth just a moment ago, are shocked in front of Camus. Soon, Camus drove his horse and approached the Baskervilles. She stopped exactly in front of Vikir and opened her mouth while making direct eye contact with Vikir. Welcome partner. Of course, this refers to the joint operation to subdue monsters and barbarians that will unfold in the future. Seeing Morg again after seven years, Tuxun had changed quite a bit. First of all, all the freckles on my face disappeared and the overteeth disappeared. Although her cheeks were chubby because she had lost some of her breast fat, the way she would grow in the future and the extent of her beauty were already slowly being revealed. Bikir recalled her appearance, having seen her from a distance a few times before returning. Was it around thirty at the time? It was pretty. Even Vikir, who had no interest in a woman's appearance, was impressed by her beautiful appearance. The expression, dazzling, could not have been more appropriate. It was said that by collecting love letters and marriage proposals from Camus, the morgue would not have to worry about firewood all winter. And Camus himself enjoyed the situation. She completely caught up with all the men by the width of her skirt and got involved in scandals here and there. Of course, this was a strategic decision. Although Camus despised men who were captivated by her beauty, she played with their hearts and encouraged competition and conflict between each family, and absorbed all of the byproducts that resulted from this under Morgue. A very political act, she ultimately gave neither her heart nor body to any man until the end, which made all men yearn for her love even more. Empress Chechen, who ruled with countless impoverished men as prisoners. She greatly prospered Morgue and made great contributions in the war against the demon world. But. This is the story before the regression. For some reason, I don't hear any scandals from the Camus I met in this life. By the time she turned fifteen, she was already managing prominent men from not only the imperial family but also the other six families, but she was surprisingly quiet. For some reason, there are only rumors that she is not seeing a single man even though she is of a reasonable age. 
It's something unknown. Vikir rode on with a bit of puzzlement. And next to him, Camus was riding close behind him. So this is not the case in the Baskervilles. Damage caused by barbarian tribes so, after classifying them in my own way in preparation for this, Morg formed an alliance with Baskerville. Talking non-stop. Bikir only responded half-heartedly a few times and didn't say anything else. Camus asked Bikir openly. It looks like the Baskervilles don't know much about their enemies and the barbarians of the Black Mountains, right? No way. These are the people who fight all the time. I will know better than you. But why did you only send the chaff? Looking at them, they are all young and insignificant hunting dogs. Camus seems to have already figured out the level of the Baskerville delegation. Bikir was about to reply, but then closed his mouth. It had already been agreed upon with the morgue that Baskerville's true main force was lurking in the mountains across from there. What are you asking when you know? Then Camus grinned. I just tried it once. I don't know whether you know or not. It's a family affair, of course I know. Am I not the person in charge of the mission here? It could be a scarecrow used as a discard within the family. But now I understand. Camus drove his horse and rode in front of Vikir. Then he looked back at Vikir and smiled. I see that you are quite trusted within the family. After that, Camus' questions continued. Do you know which tribe is the most troublesome among the barbarian tribes? There's no way you wouldn't know. One of Vikir's main missions was to search and subdue the enemy and the Black Mountains before returning. From Morg's point of view, it would be Valak, a warrior tribe. And also the Hrakoko, a tribe of shamans. The Valak tribe is the warrior tribe that appears most frequently in the border area. Although their numbers are not large, each member of the tribe is a powerful warrior, making them a difficult opponent for Baskerville. The archery they use is so powerful that it is on a different level from that of the Empire. The principle is not well known. Hmm that's right. They are an unknown people. Camus nodded and then looked back at Vakir, his eyes shining. I know well about the ecology of barbarian tribes. I'll give you eight points. That's great. I got a perfect score of 100. You failed. Camus stuck out his tongue and Vikir frowned slightly. You answered well, but why is your score like that? Because you answered well. When Vikir still looked like he didn't know, Camus had a mischievous smile on both his lips. What does a man do because he's smart? I hate smart men. After all, males are supposed to be a bit stupid. It seems that the mindset that controlled and swayed countless men before returning is not going anywhere. Bikir rode ahead, speaking faster as if it wasn't worth answering. However, Camus followed Bikir and continued to evaluate him. Six points in horsemanship. Is it because he is shorter than me? You rode a horse that was too big. Fashion four points. The clothes are too dull. You're not answering. One point for manners. Well, the face gets 99 points. You grew up well. But I lost one point because I couldn't manage my facial expressions. As I listen, my ears start to sting. Vikir spoke clearly. Stop making useless evaluations. Why is it useless? Then what is it useful for? Of course, isn't this an evaluation necessary for our future? Our future? When Vikir made a bewildered expression, Camus shrugged and stuck out his chest. He is my future husband, so I have to weigh him strictly. If I tease you, you can evaluate me too, right? No, rather, I want to be evaluated. I need to know what you think of me. Vikir asked as if he was dumbfounded by Camus' words. Why am I your husband? Why? You passed your uncle's test last time. As I thought about what he meant, I remembered that I once competed with Adolf, the representative of the House of Morg. At the time, Adolf the sorcerer had a water jar on his head, and Vikir broke the sword at the end of the sparring and used the fragments to break the jar and pass Adolf's test. But that was already seven years ago. But now Camus was talking about it as if it happened just yesterday. Camus said tremblingly. How can you judge my husband through such a crude test? It's so annoying. 
because of my uncle's decision at that time, my path to getting married was blocked. How? Since I made that promise in front of everyone, I am now married. But what can I do? Promises are a strict law. Ugh, even if I don't like it, I have to follow it. I am falling behind. No one said anything, but I'm burning hot alone. Vikir thought as he looked at that. He is truly an outstanding fire-type wizard. If you learn flame magic to the limit, will you be able to ignite spontaneously like that on your own? It was something that Vikir was slightly curious about. Anyway, that's it and this is this. As it would not be good to offend the woman who would become the head of the Morgue family in the future, Bakir was considerate of Kemu. Forget what happened that day. I'll make it like it never happened. Then, for a moment, Kemu body stiffened. Bakir thought as he looked at that. Is it paralysis magic? That split second is amazing. But why did he cast it on himself? Sometimes wizards do strange things that are incomprehensible. I wasn't particularly interested, but for diplomatic purposes, I had to ask at least what was going on. Just as Vakir was about to open his mouth. Hey! How can you make it like it never was? What happened? Camus suddenly screamed. Vakir was embarrassed for the first time since his return. The moment he opened his mouth and was about to say something. I know because I'm a genius and I never forget what I see. Along with Camus' shout, something flew into Vikir's face. A piece of black cloth. It was a robe of a size that only an eight-year-old could wear. It has the pattern of the Baskervilles clearly drawn on it and is the clothes that Vikir once covered Camus when he was naked. Even though it was seven years old, the cloak still had a faint smell of sweat from that day. Vikir, holding it in his hand, frowned at Camus, who was far ahead. You give it to me without even washing it. Episode 44, Fiancé, 2 Soon, the fortress built in Morgue came into view. Huge earthen walls stood in a circle, and watchtowers made of wood and iron could be seen here and there. Camus and Vikir were looking around the fortress and talking about various things. Barbarians are raiding ruby mines and plundering native slaves and crops. The reason they take slaves is not to save their own people, but to sell them as slaves elsewhere. Yes. Because there are countless barbarian tribes and they do not consider each other as compatriots. Therefore, they would not hesitate to sell criminals of the same tribe or prisoners of other tribes as slaves. I know very well. I'm glad I don't have to ask stupid questions like why barbarians fight among themselves. Camus stretched out his hand and pointed to the mud wall in front. It's a wall built by earth and iron wizards over the course of a month. The size of the castle wall was enormous. If ordinary people had made it, it would have taken a year, not a month. That would only be possible if hundreds of people rushed to it. Vikir approached the earthen wall. Then I saw strange things. Inside the hardened earthen wall, steel frames were embedded in a grid pattern, and the reason they were visible to Vikir was because there were holes in the wall. The earthen wall was full of holes that looked like the surface of a biscuit. Hundreds of them too. Vikir took a good look at the size of the hole. A hole that appears to be about three centimeters in diameter. It's Balak's mark. Vikir's keen eye was able to pinpoint the enemy and the famous barbarian tribes beyond the Black Mountains. Camus nodded. Balak guys are the most annoying. The arrows they shoot contain a powerful aura. There are countless people who were shot and killed while standing guard at night. Do you have the talent to overcome a 2-3 to three meter thick mud wall? It will be difficult to block even with shield magic. It flies at such a fast speed. That's right. So, not long ago, my uncle almost got into big trouble. Camus chuckled. It was said that not long ago, Adolf the magician personally went on a search and was shot by a sniper. I think my uncle was very surprised by the arrow that came through the shield magic at that time. I got a big wound on my chest. Fortunately, he survived, but his pride seems to have been greatly damaged. Now that I think about it, the head of the family said that he had a similar experience. I heard he had a cut on the bridge of his nose. Vikir recalled the scar on the bridge of Hugo's nose. 
Balak's archery skills were truly something to be wary of, having wounded sword master Hugo and class 6 master Adolf. It seems that the barbarians also have outstanding talents. Who is it? I thought it was a woman. It was so far away that I couldn't figure out who it was. Also, it is difficult to memorize them because they walk around with black paint on their faces. Camus waved his hand in frustration. Anyway. The Balak guys are the most threatening even though they only have about 300 men. Even though they are ten times less numerous than the next most threatening Rococo guys. Balak, a warlike tribe. They are barbarians who belong to neither one side or the other, living leisurely and engaging in plunder and war. They have been moving eastward rapidly for unknown reasons over the past seven years, which has led to frequent friction with Baskerville. Morg, who had recently leased some of Baskerville's territory for the development of a ruby mine, was equally annoyed by Valak. Camus looked at the sea of water beyond the distant horizon and opened his mouth. The Morg is paying close attention in its own way, but the attacks of the barbarians are so secretive that it is not easy to detect them. Moreover, we have gaps in our borders about once a month. Gap. When Vikir asked, Camus frowned. Morg is a matriarchal society, so the proportion of women is overwhelmingly high. The wizard standing guard are all women. But what does that have to do with gaps? Well, about once a month. Because there is magic. So you're wizards, right? When Vikir asked, Camus opened his mouth for a moment and then burst into laughter. You have a secretly stupid side here, don't you? Good. I like it. What can a man do because he's smart? Extra points. It was only after receiving several blows to the shoulder that Vikir understood what Camus meant. Right then. Master Viceroy. There was someone looking for Camus from afar. A female wizard hurriedly ran over and bowed down in front of Camus. The search party in the dark hall captured the barbarian scouts alive. It seemed like a prisoner had been taken. The person who was dragged along tied tightly with a rope was a man with brown skin and black hair. Vikir was able to guess the tribe by checking the tattoos on his body. He's from the shaman tribe Rococo. I don't know how he got caught here, but his fate has already been decided. More Camus. This is because she was facing the captive while emitting a terrifying aura. Did you dig up any information? Then the wizards next to him were embarrassed. I will not open my mouth. What about mental magic? It doesn't work. Due to the powerful spell, it is impossible to read the memories. Camus turned his head away. Then he walked languidly and stood in front of the prisoner. You guys attacked the fortress of Morg a while ago and kidnapped several slaves. Among those slaves were Morg's female servants. He is my second cousin. His name is Rose. Camus glared at Rococo's captive with burning eyes. What did you do with her? Then the captive's tightly shut mouth slowly opened. Unintelligible sound. Camus frowned at those words. Translate. Where are the barbarian defectors? But no one answered Camus' words. Everyone just looks at me with anxious eyes. A wizard said as if he felt sorry. When the barbarians attacked, everyone was killed or taken away, deputy chief. Then, is there no one who can interpret what I say? For now, yes. It was an embarrassing thing. When everyone is looking perplexed. You know I speak a little Rococo. Vikir stepped forward. Camus looks at Vikir with wide eyes. Do you know how to do something like that? What can't you do? It's not outstanding. I only know basic vocabulary. Vikir stood in front of Camus. Camus asked. Ask me where my cousin is. The girl who was kidnapped during the last attack. She has red hair, red eyes, and unusually white skin. She is about twelve years old. Vikir nodded and asked the Rococo prisoner in front of him. Unintelligible sound. Then a short answer came back. Unintelligible sound. Vikir's expression hardened for a moment. Finally, Vikir shook his head at Camus. He's dead. At those words, the expressions on the faces of everyone in Morg turned grim. Although death was expected at the time of kidnapping, hearing it in person was a different story. 
Soon, Camus walked forward. She growled lowly at her captive. After this war is over, your language will become a language only spoken in hell. Those were the last words the captive could hear. Camus said. The representative of Mayang Dang is currently undergoing treatment. The representative of the Hermitage is currently inspecting the territory on the other side, so the judgment here is made by me, Mord Camus, member of the House of Representatives and Deputy Fortress Commander. That ended the summary judgment. Yet. Camus waved his hands and drew a magic circle in the air. Okay. Push. A large iron skewer sprouted from the ground. The iron elements hidden among the earth elements came together and grew explosively, and the iron skewer thus formed instantly pierced Rococo's captive. From the groin to the top of the head. A prisoner struggling, unable to even scream. He was impaled on an iron skewer and nailed high in the air. And underneath, red-hot flames began to explode. Grumble. Skewered fire. Camus burned Rococo's captive to death in the blink of an eye. All the slaves who saw this look at Camus with a fearful expression. It was similar even to the people of the morgue. Grumble, rumble, crackle. Crackle. The sound of a skewered person burning to pieces. Black powder flies in the wind along with the smell of burning meat. Camus smiled calmly in front of that terrifying fire. Let's go. She quickly left the scene, taking Bakir next to her. Everyone around them just looked at the back of the two with slight fear. Meanwhile, Vikir, who had returned behind the earthen wall, was a little surprised. It's not surprising that people are being skewered alive and burned. There is no reason for Vikir to be this surprised or frightened, as he had witnessed much worse during his decades of fighting on the battlefield before returning. However, what surprised Vikir was Camus' expression. Ugh, ha! Huh. Camus went to a place where no one was around and was now crying. A distorted expression, red eyes, tears dripping down chubby cheeks. Vikir's mouth was half open because the situation was so unexpected. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I saw the world's Empress Sitian crying. Of course, I saw it when I was eight, but it feels quite different now than when I was fifteen. But I'm still fifteen years old. Bakir stared blankly at the crying Camus for a while, and after some contemplation, he opened his mouth to comfort her. Why are you crying? Why would you cry? Camus shouted loudly and looked around to see if anyone would hear. Bakir closed his mouth for a moment and then opened it again. It seems like you were very close to your younger brother. We were close. He was a child who followed me very much. He was an innocent and good child who did not fit in with the morgue. After finishing speaking, Camus squatted down and leaned against the earthen wall. Although they were similar in height, she now seemed much shorter than usual for some reason. Bikir thought so. Don't be too sad. I would have gone comfortably. When Bikir offered awkward words of comfort, Camus responded harshly. Who do you think is a fool? A question filled with a mixture of anger and sadness. Vikir noticed. Camus understood Rococo's words. I am a genius. I can't speak, so I can only listen. Tell me straight. Is what I heard true? At Camus' words, Vikir could only nod with a heavy expression. The last words of Rococo's prisoner were not dead. 8. The Rococo is both a tribe of shamans and a cannibal tribe. It is their custom to eat captives. After hearing Vikir's confirmation, Camus began to cry again. Sorry. Sorry. Because I couldn't protect you. I'm sorry about my sister. Camus crying loudly. Vikir just stands next to her and remains silent. I thought it was surprising that this figure was hidden behind the mask of Morg Camus, the queen of red and black, fire and skewers. And after some time has passed. Camus stood up. She rubbed her cheek with her sleeve, wiping away the dried tear stains. Camus returned to his original cold expression. She looked at Vakir, who was standing blankly next to her. It wasn't bad. If I had been clumsy in sympathizing with him, I would have killed him. There was no way that a trivial threat from a fifteen-year-old girl would have any effect on a veteran who had experienced all kinds of hardships, but Vakir nodded anyway. Well, anyway. 
sometimes, just being silently by your side can be comforting. I didn't know what to do with the crying 15-year-old girl, so staying quiet paid off this time. Soon, Camus tapped Vakir on the chest. There is no time to be sad. We need to pull ourselves together and get revenge as quickly as possible. Follow me. There's something we need to do together. It was Camus who spoke in a quite determined voice. Episode 45, Fiancé, 3. Seven years ago. In the Rue Morgue, there was a bright eight-year-old girl. Morgue Camus. The youngest head of the sorceress family, Morgue. Her extraordinariness was unique from the very beginning. A time when the young children of Morgue gathered to listen to magic lectures. Well, the path to the magic world is difficult. Just as when you look into the abyss, the abyss also looks into you. If you look into the deep world of magic, you may be eaten by a huge demon, so you must always be careful. When the children who heard the tutor's words each felt vague fear and panic. Just one person. Camus was snorting. That's nonsense. The tutor frowns at those words. Camus. Why does it make no sense? They say that when I look into the abyss, the abyss also looks into me. That's bullshit. Camus continued speaking with a sour expression. The abyss of magic is so wide and deep that the human mind cannot dare to understand it. If I look into the abyss, does the abyss also look into me? Nonsense. How big is the abyss, does it look into me? Just because the ants can see me doesn't mean I can see the ants, the abyss doesn't know if I can look into it. I'm not interested. So being afraid that the abyss will look into me is excessive self-consciousness. Well, I don't know if it reaches a certain level. I'm telling you, don't instill fear in kids who can't even handle mana properly yet. At those words, the tutor fell silent. Because what Camus said was definitely right. While he also rose to class 5 and was able to roll 5 mana circles, he was never eroded by the abyss of magic. Of course, it would be a different story if you went beyond the seventh class, which is said to be the ultimate in magic, and reached the point where you could knock on the door of the higher level. Eventually, when the boring class ended, Camus got up and left the room with a sour expression on his face. What is my uncle doing? The only person in this family who understands his talent and can comfortably share his inner thoughts. Camus preferred her younger brother, Morg Adolf, to her mother and matriarch, Morg Lespiné. At that time, Camus heard his mother, Les Payne, and his uncle, Adolf, talking in front of the family home. The ruby vein extends underground into the Baskerville family estate. Yes, sister. I think a collision is inevitable. It's a big deal. Hugo, I don't want to bow down to that idiot plus, that place is infested with barbarians. Then will it be a three-way match? First of all, since the vein extends into the Baskerville family's territory, we are at a legal disadvantage. Also, the barbarians there are the ones that the Baskerville family has been struggling with for several years, so if a conflict breaks out there, great damage is expected within the family in many ways. Les Payne and Adolf looked serious. And Camus took his place. I'll take a look. Les Payne and Adolf were surprised at those words. He knows what kind of problem this is. For a moment. Sister. Let's listen to what the child has to say. Camus is a genius. Do you know anything? It might point out things that adults can't see. This is why Camus likes his uncle Adolf. Eventually, Lespinay and Adolf, who heard what Camus said, nodded with an expression of doubt. Hmm. Let's use a child's technique to push it, okay? After that, let's solidify our cooperation system and pursue joint development projects. Um. It's not a bad opinion. It was a truly cute opinion, one that would be hard to believe came from the head of an eight-year-old child. Furthermore. And wouldn't it be good if we discussed the issue of marriage together? Rather than bowing down, I like the idea of joint business between in-laws. The so-called, marriage strategy. Camus came up with another good suggestion. Les Payne asked with a bright look in his eyes. You mean an engagement with the Baskervilles? Then who should we send? Well. What, anyone? What about the useless Hysis, Middlesis, and Losis triplet sisters? 
Camus just answers indifferently, without thinking much. The morgue began negotiations immediately. Adolphe took Camus to the Baskervilles, and Camus used his status as a child to talk to Hugo. He compared the mineral veins extending underground to the hand and forearm. But, for the first time since his birth, Camus had to suffer a bitter defeat. That guy. An eight-year-old child came out from the opposing camp as well. I don't know the logic, but in any case, I was definitely pushed by, that guy, in terms of momentum. Camus ended up crying and was on the verge of losing his mind from anger. I have never experienced anything like this before. There was no one among teenagers, let alone eight-year-olds, who could beat him. This was true even for adults. Everything in the world always went as Camus wanted, and it never went beyond expectations. But that day was different. Everything deviated from Camus' will. And the reason was because of, that guy, the black-haired kid I met for the first time that day. If it weren't for you. So Camus was angry. He wanted to show his true worth to the enemy he met for the first time in his life. So, in the training ground where swords and magic clash, Camus challenged, that guy, to a fight. I attacked with all my might. But, that guy, was obnoxiously avoiding me. Tack Kong. Crackle beans. My teeth were shaking, and I was snapping my fingers on my forehead, as if I was just playing around. Even the pain was really painful as I continued to get hit in the same spot. A close-up of the ugly face of, that guy, appears before your eyes. I felt like I was going blind with anger. It feels like you and that guy are the only two left in the world. The only thought in my head was that I wanted to give, that guy, a punch. Right then. Grumble. An accident occurred in the gym next door. There was a huge explosion, and all of my clothes were burned by the residual flames. I hurriedly tried to hide behind the dust and smoke, but it only prevented my naked body from being revealed for a few seconds. Then I finally became worried. Besides yourself and, that guy, there are countless other people here. What kind of disgrace is this? The supernova of the House of Morgue, a genius, the next head of the family, and the person who received all kinds of respect and trust suddenly found herself showing her naked body in front of everyone. Even eight-year-olds have innocence. I mean, I have my own pride. Camus desperately held back tears. To be completely naked in front of the kids of the same age who always ignored and despised me. In particular, weren't the three sisters, high sis, middle sis, and low sis, who were climbing up in a particularly obnoxious manner, in the gym next door. I didn't want to cry naked in front of those bitches. Because you will be made fun of for the rest of your life. But what? But there was no way to escape from this situation. Soon the dust will clear and you will become a laughing stock throughout the world. Am I going to die? Camus truly thought this. Right then. Flap. The front of my eyes turned black. Something heavy but warm and cozy covered Camus a naked body. When I raise my head, I see, that guy, in front of me. He took off his clothes and covered them, leaving him naked. Isn't he embarrassed? Camus thought so, but, that guy, didn't seem to think so. He proudly displayed his naked body to the world. Without any sign of shame. Camus felt his heart pounding as he looked at his naked body. The enemy I met for the first time in my life, the defeat I experienced for the first time in my life, the confident attitude I saw for the first time in my life, and the naked body of the opposite sex I saw for the first time in my life. Numerous beginnings were tangled in a complicated manner in Camus' mind. The moment her good head stopped for the first time, even the time flowing around her stopped along with it. Camus stared blankly at, that guy, for a long time. Secretly thinking in my heart that it was a good idea to come up with the, marriage strategy, before leaving the family. And then it goes on and on. That guy, got into a competition with his uncle. Camus had always liked and followed his uncle, but at that moment, he thought that his uncle was somehow mean. The adults are all grown up and persecute the children. I thought I was grateful for always treating my younger self like an adult, but not as much as at this moment. But? That guy, continued to challenge his uncle. An indomitable fighting spirit that does not give up even in the face of a very obvious gap in skill. Camus felt complicated. 
I knew my uncle's strength and greatness, but he couldn't stop his eyes from falling on that guy. I was surprised at the fact that deep down, I was hoping for such a ridiculous situation where that guy would beat my uncle. And the fantasy became reality. In a situation where even the strong Camus thought there was no hope, that guy surprisingly managed to overcome his uncle. Slurp, rippling. My uncle had a blank expression on his face as he looked at the broken water jar and the flowing water. Camus unknowingly cheered at this shocking result. He even jumped up and down in place. Her uncle looked shocked and said he was sorry, but that was none of her business. She had always despised the frivolous laughter and jumping of eight-year-olds her age, but before she knew it, she was laughing and running like an ordinary eight-year-old. After negotiations are successfully concluded. Camus arrived home and lay down on the bed. The doll that I always hugged tightly when I slept decided to place it proudly next to me starting today. Because I'm not a child anymore. Instead, the habit of always hugging and sleeping changed. The black blood of the Baskervilles. The cape that, that guy, covered that day became Camus' number one favorite item. Camus slept hugging the clothes every night, and always buried his face deep in the clothes when he slept. For some reason, I thought the musty smell of sweat was a good smell, and I could sleep well if I buried my nose in it. Sometimes my heart suddenly started pounding, sometimes I felt itchy all over my body, and sometimes I had a sudden urge to bite the collar of my clothes with my teeth. When the nanny tried to do the laundry, Camus raised his hand and firmly stopped her. Something like this is only worth it if you don't wash it. Since then, Camus has never washed this blood garment. Even after the seasons changed and several birthday cakes came and went, Camus always thought the same thing. Where would you be by now? What are you doing? Have you grown taller? That's how the girl became a lady. Camus always went to the ruby mine under the excuse that he liked rubies, but he couldn't see that guy. I only heard through rumors that they were going through a long battle training. And how much time has passed? Camus heard a rumor one day. The Baskerville family's territory is adjacent to the Morgue family's territory, and a fairly large city is located in the corner. There was a rumor that a new young vice consul had been appointed there. From what I heard, there were several major accidents as soon as he took office. Of course, that accident is not really an accident, but rather a huge achievement. When Camus heard that 10 billion won had been burned on a single stick, he slapped his knee. You grew up well. She went to find a place to go that way. What? Do you want me to send you on a joint operation with the Baskervilles? Yes mom. Right now. Camus begged the head of the family, Les Bonnet, and headed to the Baskervilles estate. Before that, I did not forget to identify the newly appointed deputy consul in Underdog City as a partner in the joint operation. And the day before the Baskerville delegation arrived, Camus was fully prepared. The watchtower of the fortress, which had many beautiful cotton flowers nearby, was chosen as the meeting place. Because it was a bit embarrassing, I kept Morg's eyes as far back as possible. The seven year wait will end in a place filled with white flowers and delicate scents. Camus went to bed with a swollen chest. And on the same day, Camus was furious. I chose a place with a nice atmosphere, but it had already turned into a mess. The older sisters who were always mean to me when I was younger, and now that I'm older and don't even dare to breathe properly in front of them, ruin things. What are they doing? Camus asked with hellish anger. The aftermath of romantic destruction was terrifying. The three sisters of the morgue are crying without knowing why. Hey, Camus, you sisters. Ugh, just trying to stop intruders. Well, they started the fight first. But Camus' mood was already at rock bottom. Because the reunion we had been waiting for for seven years ended up being a mess. Camus. Are you talking to me now, sisters? Hi. Oh no. Is that not possible, Master Vice President? Move. If you don't want to be like that. Camus didn't really intend to kill the three sisters, but he was willing to scold them really harshly. But there was no need for that effort because they crawled away on their own before that. Yet. Camus rode his horse and stood in front of that guy. Welcome partner. 
The face of that guy I saw again after seven years wasn't that different from when I first met him. It seems that he is still in the growth phase, but his height is not much different from his own, but his face has changed slightly. The jawline became slimmer and the nose became more prominent. It was better than the glorified and glorified version in Camus' imagination. You've grown a lot. Hmm. You grew up well. Camus nodded. Her face automatically turns red. Why does the naked body of the guy I saw when I was eight suddenly come to mind? M.O., has your body changed a lot? Even though I didn't use any magic, my whole body felt hot for no reason.